Hello, this is your host, Adam Graham, from Pretty Much the Present. And in this video, we'll be bringing you a compilation of old-time radio detective podcasts from 2010. The podcasts are appearing, for the most part, unedited, except for some extraneous or repetitive elements that are being removed because this is a compilation. As I said, these are old, so any websites or offers mentioned may not be valid at the time you're listening unless you find them on our website currently. Now, with that said, here is a week of Old Time Radio Detective podcast. <laughs> Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you this week's episode of Box 13. If you have any comments, please feel free to email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Please cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And uh, please visit our Facebook page, facebook.greatdetectives.net. All right, well, I want to continue for just a moment on the whole conversation I was having last Friday about Agatha Christie and old-time radio. Now, I've not had time to hear back from anyone else if they're aware of any Agatha Christie detectives um, in old-time radio. Uh, but what I've been able to locate has mostly been um, there was a Poirot um, radio series, uh, there was also a performance of the Campbell's Playhouse uh, featuring a uh, Poirot mystery. And then there was a show called Murder Clinic, um, which aired from 42 to 43. And it featured several, uh, several stories from Agatha Christie, uh, some with Poirot, but there was also one with uh, Miss Marple. And then another one with someone I'd not heard before, uh, Parker Pine. Now, while I was researching this, um, I came up, uh, now I should mention that the episodes with Marple and Parker Pine and all but one episode with Poirot of uh, Murder Clinic are basically lost at this point. Um, but uh, while I was doing all this research, I came up with something very relevant to Box 13 as well as to let George do it. Um, th these shows are both noted for their introductions, the, un uh, the unique style uh, that involves uh, an advertisement run in a newspaper. Um, well, I found the, a potential inspiration for this that may have been an inspiration for the creators of Box 13 and Let George Do It. Um, and it actually comes from an Agatha, Agatha Christie novel called The Secret Advers Adversary featuring uh, Tommy and Tuppence. I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly, Tuppence. Um, and uh, they basically, their way of getting business is to run an ad. And here is the ad copy they came up with. Two young adventurers for hire, willing to do anything, go anywhere, pay must be good, no unreasonable offer refused. Um, they were kind of desperate for work. Um, so, yeah, we'll even take an unreasonable offer. Uh, but that, to me, sounds a lot like the Box 13 ad. Um, and so I think that Chris, uh, Christie's uh, device was certainly an inspiration for the creators of both, uh, of both shows, because I see, um, I see a lot, I think there's a definite connection there. So, just a little tidbit. Um, but uh, we're going to go ahead and get into today's episode of Box 13. This one is Diamond in the Sky. We'll get into it in a second. Before we do, I want to uh, encourage you, um, if, as you make your travel plans for the new year, remember this one website, johnnydollarair.com. Uh, johnnydollarair.com is Priceline.com, so you get the great deals that come along with Priceline, 
as well as being able to support great old-time radio. So just remember that name, johnnydollarair.com. But let's get into today's episode, Diamond in the Sky. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Care of Star Times. You advertised for adventure? I have it for you. If you will go any place, I can offer Paris. If you will do anything, you are the man I need. If you are interested, call at my office any day between the hours of 10 a.m. and noon. Any day between the hours of 10 a.m. and noon. I am at 247 Wabash Place, signed William Martin. Paris. <laughs> Adventure. What a dream that could have been. It was, but the awakening was different. <laughs> Now, back to Box 13, and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Diamond in the Sky. It sounded great. A trip to Paris, and adventure for the frosting on the cake. <laughs> Whoever Mr. William Martin was, he must have known that waving a deal like that in front of anyone was making it a sure thing. But Susie, as usual, had something to say. I don't know, Mr. Holliday. Maybe it's just somebody kidding you. Hmm, that's the girl, Susie. Get out the wet blankets, spread them around. Then again, maybe this Mr. Martin is, is beyond approach. The word, Susie, is reproach. But I've got a brilliant idea. What, Mr. Holliday? It's all very simple. I go to see Mr. William Martin at 247 Wabash Place. <laughs> Wabash Place was one of those little streets filled with small businesses. But number 247 was by itself. No display window in front like the others. I thumbed a bell button that had a card under it with William Martin engraved on it. One minute later, after introductions, I was looking across a desk at a short, stocky, apple-cheeked man who said, No one knows you have come here, Mr. Holiday? No, just my secretary. <gasps> oh, but she won't say anything. You're positive? I am. Oh, good. A uh, cigarette, Mr. Holiday. Oh, yes, thanks. And uh, a light. <coughs> <coughs> you do not like my brand, huh? All this lacks is a fuse. What's in it? <laughs> my special tobacco. Uh, but uh, here's an ashtray. Uh, thanks. Well, Mr. Martin, you wrote that letter to Box 13, and here I am. Ah, good. Down to business, then. He opened a drawer, took out a photograph, and slid it across the desk for me. What I saw was a picture of a diamond. But what a piece of ice. I was studying it when Martin spoke again. I see by your expression, Mr. Holliday, that you are properly impressed. Oh, I'm impressed, Mr. Martin. What is this, the Rock of Gibraltar or something? <laughs> Not quite. That is the Mirabilis diamond. Oh. You've heard of it, then? Yes, yes, but how does it concern me? Now, here. These credentials will tell you who I am. William Martin. Well, that's my name, yes, but, uh, well, you look. Martin passed me a sheet of papers with his photo on them. He was William Martin, representative of Jason Van... Van de Clare. Hmm, that name sounded familiar. Martin read my expression again and... Mr. Van der Clift is a diamond merchant. He has recently purchased the Mirabilis for a million dollars. That's a lot of hay for a lot of ice. I beg your pardon? <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Martin. The gem is in Paris. I am to get it and bring it over here. I see. And, uh, Box 13? You will go with me, Mr. Holliday. I have reservations for you on the Oh, now, just a minute. I'm not a bodyguard, Mr. Martin, or a private detective. Uh, please, I... please. Nothing so crude, Mr. Holliday. No, I have a much better plan. But first, let me tell you something. There is no jewel thief in the world who would not risk everything to get the Mirabilis. He could never sell it. No, no. But it could be cut up, and any one of the smaller stones would more than repay the thief for their trouble. Yes, I guess you're right. 
Okay, where do I come in? Well, it is very simple. But like all simple things, it is brilliant. I thought of it. Mm, congratulations. Thank you. Now, you will pick up the diamond in Paris. I will go on the same plane, but we shall be complete strangers to each other. Do you begin to see Mr. Holiday? Sure. If anyone's wise that you're going over to get the stone, they'll follow you. Exactly. But I won't have it. You will. I shall stroll around Paris as a, as a tourist. Anyone following me will be, uh, shall we say, following a red mackerel? <laughs> All right, let's say it. Oh, uh, but there's only one thing wrong. Wrong? I did not think of something important? Yeah, that, that's right. Uh, me. Suppose this plan doesn't fool anyone. Then I'm set up like a clay pigeon. You lose a Mirabilis, and I'm just another claim for the insurance company. Oh, no, no, alors. You have no worry. Well, maybe I worry easily, Mr. Martin, especially if I'm carrying a million dollars worth of bait. Mr. Holliday, only you and I know of this. There can be no leak of information unless you tell someone. <laughs> oh, sure, I'll go around telling everyone that Dan Holliday's a setup. Here I am, fellas. Come and get me. <laughs> That's right. And thieves would kill to get the diamond. They have already. Why, I can tell you the history of the stone. Calcutta, murder. London, murder. Vienna, two deaths. And uh, the... Mr. Martin, skip the cook's tour of the morgue, will you? But you advertised for adventure, Mr. Holliday. You will go any place, do anything. Well? Touché. A little below the belt, but touché. And you've added one more to the population of Paris. Martin's plan was simple, and if it worked, a good way to get the Mirabilis into the United States. I said if. Hey, who invented that word? Well, it was three days later that I was ready to leave, passport okay, papers in order, and a phone call from Martin warning me not to recognize him when we were on the plane. I gave instructions to Susie and left for the airport. <laughs> hours later, I was out over the Atlantic. Martin sat well in front of me and never once looked back. So I played it his way, and beyond a quick look, paid no attention to him. Then, as I was settling down to watch the ocean go past underneath, Mr. I... Mr. Holliday? Mr. Dan Holliday? Uh, yes, I'm Holliday. I'm Irene Carson, your stewardess. Oh, how are you? Fine. And you? Wonderful, thank you. Good. Here's a letter for you. Letter? You're sure it's for me? Mr. Holliday, seat 19, flight 12. Check all the way through on that. All right, thanks, Miss Carson. You're welcome, sir. Oh, Miss Carson. Is there something you want? Well, just an answer to a question. Who gave you this? Well, no one. It was among last-minute letters and packages and gifts for our passengers. Oh, I see. Well, thanks again, Miss Carson. Not at all, Mr. Holliday. The letter was from Martin, brief and to the point. I was to go to an address in Paris and stay there until he called. Well, Mr. Martin was playing them close to his vest. Maybe he didn't trust me. <laughs> and who could blame him? With a million dollars worth of diamond for an ante, he wasn't dealing all the cards at once. Well, all I had to do was wait until morning in Paris. Early next morning, we landed at the Bourget Field. I stuck close behind Martin leaving the plane, but he didn't give me a tumble, so, well, I guess my cue was to hold up at the address mentioned in the letter until he got in touch. I was trying to flag down a taxi when... Is this the last time you saw Paris, Mr. Holliday? Oh, hello there, Miss Carson. <laughs> Looks like you're having trouble. Yes, a little. Say, um, how do you get one of these grounded grasshoppers to stop? You wave in French, like this. Oh, just like that, huh? <laughs> Just like that. Teach me to wave like that, and I'll be able to get a taxi in Paris. Of course, if you lend me your face. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing to it. Oh, I um, I almost forgot. I came out here to find you. Oh? Something wrong? Passport? Papers? No, or... but I believe this is yours. How did you get this? I found it on the floor of the plane just after you left. Oh? What's the matter? I... Nothing. Can I give you a lift? No, thanks. I have my reports to make out. Maybe some other time if we're still in Paris, huh? Well, I'll be for three days before the hop back to the States. No, I see. Well, thanks a lot, Miss Carson. I'll be seeing you. I hope so, Mr. Holliday. 
He walked away from me. In my hand was the letter from Martin telling me where to stay until I heard from him. I hopped into the cab, gave the driver the address, and then leaned back in the seat to do some thinking. The letter was in my inside coat pocket. Pretty hard for anything to fall out of there. But my coat had been on a hanger, and I'd been away from it just long enough for anyone to pick up that letter. So, if anyone was wise to the way the game was being played, Martin was home safe, while I stood a better than even chance of being picked off a first base. A half hour later, I was sitting in the little room at the address given me when... Yes? Uh, we? Hello. Yes? Oh, Martin? Yes. Everything was all right? Uh, fine. Now what? You are sure no one knows where you are? Well, I... Holiday. All right, no one knows. Now what? Here is an address. Go to it. There you will pick up the package. Okay. Now, don't write this down. Remember it. Please. All right. All right, I can remember it. 45, Rue de la Guerre. 45... No, no, but... no, no. no. Do not repeat it there. Just remember it. All right, all right. Please, Mr. Holiday, you understand my concern. Look, my neck's out of yard too, Martin. Of course, of course. Now listen. There is a Monsieur Corey. Ask for him. Identify yourself with these words. I've come from the sky. You hear that? I got it. Then what? There will be no question. Those words are our code. Now... I am registered at the Vendôme Hotel. Leave the package for me at the desk. Uh, just like that, I leave a I package for... I know what I am doing. Now, that is all. The rest is up to you, Mr. Holiday. Okay. And, uh, Mr. Holiday. Yes, what now? For your sake, I sincerely hope nothing goes wrong. <laughs> And now, back to Box 13 and Diamond in the Sky with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. The rest was up to me, Martin said. All I had to do was collect a marvelous diamond, see that I wasn't caught off base, deliver it to Martin, and then that was all. I hailed a cab on the street. Uh, Saint Rue de la Guerre. Beat. Governor, with an accent like that, just talk English. Huh. Guess it wasn't very good, huh? Are you an American? No, a Londoner from Limehouse. Hop in, sir. That was 45 Rue de la Guerre, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. How did you know I was American? You kidding? I drove a cab three years in Brooklyn. He wants to know how I know he's an American. Okay, Limehouse. Then you should know what this means. Step on it, never mind the tickets, huh? Blimey, I ain't heard that since the days in Flatbush. Hold on, pal. Here we go. You're here, Governor. Want me to wait? Yeah, and keep that motor hot. Hey, what's up? I don't know. Something hot? <laughs> Just wait. Okay, Governor. I'll be here. I went into the house, asked for Monsieur Corre. Gave him the code words, I've come from the sky. And without a word, he went to the fireplace, lifted out a brick and handed me a velvet case. Well, after all this, I... I had to take a look. Inside the case... Well, the Marabolus looked like a piece of something that would make any crook risk his neck. Or mine. I snapped the case shut. Hooray said nothing, just watched me. Showed me out. All right, Limehouse. Vondome Hotel and on the way. Don't bother to fly alone. Well, I don't know what this is all about, sir. But when you went in that house, that car pulled up back of us and stopped. Huh? And they kept their motor hot, too. Limehouse was right. It looked as though somebody had talked, but not me, and certainly not Martin. We pulled away, the big car tailed after us. Limehouse turned his head to talk to me. They're tailing us, all right. Can you get away? With this act, the three cylinders still work, and I got asthma. You've got to make it. What did you do? Pinch the crown jewels? You're warm. Step on it and do your best, will you? Did you pull a heist? No. Okay, you've got an honest face. All right, Governor. There's nothing keeping this act together but termites holding hands. But here we go. Big car in the back didn't lose an inch in Limehouse, and I had to go through an empty stretch of road. So I told him I thought that's where the mugs in the big car would make their pitch, and 
Yes, you're right, but I've got an idea. Well, I can use it. Listen, look down the street. See that turn to the right? Yeah. I'll get close to the curb as I can, and you get ready for a jump. Huh? Jump? Sure. I'll act like I'm going straight. But where I showed you, I'll turn fast to the right. You jump out, roll in a doorway or something. Well, what about you? I'll make a U-turn back out and pull the mugs down the street after me. You got it? Got it. Oh, uh, here's your fare. Plus. <laughs> Ain't had so much fun since Coney Island. Okay, pal. Try for the brass ring. Nah! Attaboy, Lion Hoss. It worked. I collected a few bruises, but I still had the diamond. Farther down the road, Lion Hoss stopped. He had to because the boys in the big car angled in front of his cab. I waited long enough to make sure Limehouse was going to keep his health. Then I doubled back and forth until I came out on the main street. There I took a bus. I I felt like having lots of people around. I got to the Bon Dome Hotel, walked to the desk, and told the clerk I wanted to leave a package for Monsieur William Martin. Oh, brother, I got the surprise of my life when the clerk told me there was no Monsieur William Martin registered there. Well, I sat down to figure that one out. Then, just when I was about to give up, I... Holiday. No, no, no. Don't look at me. Martin. What the devil? Pretend that you are not speaking to me. Now, you have the stone? Yes, but I almost did that. What happened? It's a long story. You want to hear it now? No, no, no. We have not enough time. Look, I will put part of my newspaper on the sofa between us. Then, when no one is looking... Put the diamond under the paper. Okay, then what? After a minute, I will pick up the newspaper and leave. Oh, and I hope this ice goes with you, Mr. Martin. <laughs> it will. Don't worry. Well, that looked like it. All finished. Huh. I counted chickens that weren't there. A half hour later, I went to the room of my hotel. I just had the door open when... my deep dream of peace with a knot on my head and a distaste for the whole proceedings. And the room? Well, it was in shambles. Somebody had fine combed it after drumming on my head. The manager knew nothing about it. Well, that made us even because I, I couldn't figure why somebody took the trouble to slug me and search the room when I didn't have the diamond. Unless... Unless somebody thought I was still carrying it. That somebody... I had an idea, and 40 minutes later, I was sitting across from Irene Carson at a little sidewalk cafe. Mr. Holliday, you, you, you're insane. I will be after another knock on the head. But why do you accuse me? Because no one but Martin knew where I was going to stay in Paris. And you. But this is ridiculous. How should I know? The letter you said dropped out of my pocket. It did drop from your pocket, and I did not read it. Really, I, I think this is a ridiculous story. A Mr. Martin who wasn't at his hotel to, to pick up a diamond worth a million dollars, men chasing you, hitting you, searching your room. And now, simply because I had my hands on a letter, you accuse me of a... Who else knew? You're Mr. Martin. And that's another thing. I never saw you with anyone on that plane. You spoke to no one. You got off alone. <laughs> really, Mr. Holliday, it's a fantastic story. No one saw me with Martin. Exactly. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to get back to Le Bourget. You've taken up too much of my time already. I... All right, Miss Carson. But will you do me a favor? What? Confess to the whole thing? Admit I'm a notorious international jewel thief? No, I... Just get me on a plane back to the States. Look, I... Uh, I apologize. All right. All right, I accept the apology. And I'll do my best to get you out of Paris. You, uh, you seem to be allergic to trouble here. You're so right, Miss Carson. You're so right. After that rigmarole in Paris, New York's LaGuardia Airport sure looked good to me. I was leaving the field when... Welcome home, Holiday. Well, Cling, what a nice surprise. I've got more. Come on. Hey, wait a minute. What is this? You're a writer. Write a line for yourself now. What are you talking about? I'm talking about a pinch, Holiday, which this is. Arrested? Now, wait a minute. It didn't make sense. 
Nothing made sense. On the way into the city, Kling wouldn't say a word. For every question I asked, he growled. But finally in his office... Where's the diamond, Holiday? Diamond? Mirabilis, Schmirabilis. Where is it? I smuggled it in, Kling. So you got through customs. Now quit stalling. Where is it? Are you kidding? A million in ice and nobody kids. Nobody. Now wait a minute. Why did you pick me up? I stopped in at your office to say hello, and Susie told me that you were in Paris. Yesterday we got word from Jason Vandercliff that the Mirabilis diamond he was to get from Paris hasn't shown up. We checked with the Paris police. A guy named Corey... Described me. Is that it? Yeah. Susie tells me you're in Paris. Corey describes you, and two and two make four. Now start talking. Well, I told Kling the story, starting with Martin's letter to Box 13 and ending with my return to the States. Can you prove that yarn? Get Martin and ask him. That'll be a little tough. He's dead. What? Yeah. When did you leave for Paris? Day before yesterday. Martin's body was found in the river that day. We didn't get an identification until yesterday. Vandercliff identified him. Clingy, you're, you're crazy. I tell you, Martin went to Paris on the same plane with me. Here's Martin's photograph. Take a good look. This isn't Martin. Vandercliff ought to know. His own agent. And the Martin... The Martin I went with was a fake. Yeah. Who probably killed the real Martin. Took his place, used his own photo and the credentials he showed you. I... Whew. Uh, that's a brilliant remark. Uh, but the crooks who chased me in Paris, my being hit over the head after I got the diamond, I... Yeah. It's easy to figure now. Your fake... Martin sent those hoods after you to get the diamond and get rid of you for good so you couldn't identify him. That's why he wasn't registered at the hotel, because he didn't expect me to show up at the diamond. And the crack over the head, your, your room, sir. Sure, sure, sure. When I got away from his boys, he sent them to my room, thinking I might go back there before I went to the Vendôme. I walked in while they were searching the room, and they slugged me. I, don't, don't you see, Kling? I, I'm in the clear. Yeah? How? Well, because I had nothing to do with the... the, the Holiday, the... you've got your story. But only Martin can keep you out of jail. Then you've got to find Martin. How? He must have taken an earlier flight from Paris. But how could he get the diamond through customs? I don't know. You know, Holiday, this looks like the end of Box 13 for you. Martin loses himself in a city of seven million, lays low and leaves you to take the rap. What if I find him? You'll still have to make him talk. Listen, Kling. You know I've never been mixed up in anything shady. Maybe I've been roped in because I follow things through, but, but never deliberately. What are you getting at? Well, will you let me find Martin? How? You're our only link with him, and you don't know a thing about him. He could dye his hair, leave off his glasses. I know, I know, but, uh, but if I don't find him, I'm in, I'm in trouble, is that right? You've never been more right in all your life. All right. If I don't find him in 24 hours, I'll walk back in here and you can do what you want with me. Is that a deal? Uh, you know, Holiday, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a cop. My father wanted me to be a sign painter. Now I realize my father was a smart man. All right, go ahead. A needle in a haystack. I was hunting for it, and it was a pretty sharp needle. Any character who could think up a frame as neat as this one would be tough to locate, if he was still in town. But I had to go ahead. It took me two hours to remember something that would help me. Seven hours more to follow it up and an hour to get hold of Irene Carson and take her with me. Then call Kling and give him the setup. It was later that night that I knocked on the door. Yes? Who is it? Telegram from Mr. Benjamin Slade. Oh, one moment, please. Hello, Martin. Martin? I used to be a salesman. I'm good at sticking my foot in doors. Who are you? Mother Hubbard, and I've come to take a look in your cupboard, Mr. Martin. <laughs> My name is Slade, Benjamin Slade. So, you did dye your hair. And you're much prettier without glasses. I have never seen you before in my life. Yes, but I've seen too much of you. Come on, Slade, or Martin, give it up, will you? What brought you here? One of your peculiar cigarettes. I remembered I tried to smoke one when I first met you. <laughs> You're insane. Yeah. I went to your fake office in Wabash Place. There was an ashtray with some cigarette butts still in it. It took me seven hours to run down the dealer who makes your cigarettes. Clever. 
But I still deny ever having seen you before in my life. Oh? Okay, let's try something else. Come in, please, will you? Martin, this is Miss Carson. Our steward is on a trip over, remember? Mm -hmm. Miss Carson, is this the man who gave you the letter to give to me? I... Yes, that's the man. I did not give Oh, the... oh, 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 oh. Slips count in this game, Martin. Besides, your handwriting in the letter can be identified. You're too much too clever. Dr. Miss Carson? <gasps> oh! Okay, Martin, without a gun, you're just another sitting duck. Now, get up and come on. <laughs> Mark for that, Susie. He left it in Paris. Oh. He got out and planned to return later. The Paris police have found it. You know, <laughs> he was pretty silly. Silly? Oh, how'd you figure that out, Susie? Well, a million dollars. Jeepers, look at all the income tax he'd have to pay on it. Huh? Oh. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box. Thirteen. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his latest picture, Psy Guy. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandbell, with an original story by Sal Shore, adapted for radio by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker and Lieutenant Kling by Edmund MacDonald. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Welcome back. You know, I think that some people uh, have the whole Box 13 concept uh, pegged as, Hello, I am really ready for you to take advantage of me. Oh... Well, it's a hard way to get plots, but at least I doubt he runs into much writer's block. All right, well, we'll go ahead and we'll wrap this up. Got any comments? Send them to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. No, I'm not taking a trip to Paris um, to pick up a diamond anyway. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you this week's episode of Pat Novak for Hire. If you have any comments on the show, please feel free to email them to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Remember to cast your vote on Podcast Alley once a month, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And remember our listener survey, if you haven't filled that out, survey.greatdetectives.net. We actually got a comment on Pat Novak over on the homepage on the Pat Novak page. He writes... The most, uh, Bill writes, the most amazing thing about Pat Novak is how the show deftly manages to walk a tightrope between brilliances and absurdity. Each episode is a cut from the mold mishmash of maladroit thugs, predatory women, uh, banal cops, and small time megalomaniacs, all held in precarious unity by Novak's overheated dialogue and Jocko Madigan's booze induced existential probity. Does it work like gangbusters? Good night, lover. Um, and Bill about summarizes it right. That's what makes this show work. Um, and it's a th and it really is. Um, it really is a thing of uh, of beauty to listen to, uh, because you would not think this show would work uh, if you sat down and said, "Okay, here's the idea." You got this guy. He's not really a private investigator, uh, but people come and offer him money for things. And then he always uh, stumbles in, gets knocked out, and finds himself accused of murder. Uh, I don't know if people, uh, if we would think that we'd find it entertaining, but you listen and you're like, wow, it does work. So, fantastic summary. Thanks for the comment, Bill. Well, we're going to get into today's episode in just a second. Before we do, I want to encourage you, as you make your hosting plans for the new year, 
uh, if you got to start a business or if you want to start that personal website and want lots of, of space with no limits on bandwidth, then just remember our host, the world's number one web host, one and one Just go to hosting.greatdetectives.net. Uh, and uh, we, I, I use them, and I recommend them to you. Uh, re uh, consider them for personal, small business, big business, and even just uh, domain purchases. Hosting.greatdetectives.net. Um, but let's get into today's episode of Pat Novak for Hire. Uh, this one is called Give Envelope to John St. John. Pat Novak. Hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak for hire. Uh. in front of my office says, Pat Novak for hire. Down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you don't get prizes for being subtle. If you want to make a living down here, you got to get your hand in the till any way you can. You rob Peter to pay Paul, and then you put it on the cup. So I rent boats and tell a few white lies if the price is right. It's a happy life, if you don't mind looking up at a headstone, because sooner or later you draw trouble a size too big. I found that out Tuesday night. It was raining, and the street was as deserted as a warm bottle of beer. It must have been about 11 o'clock when I came out of the office and started down the waterfront. As I got near the corner, I stopped. An old man stepped out of the darkness and started across the street. It was a short trip because a car started up down the street, and the old man couldn't have made it with a pocket full of aces. I started over to him. The car slowed down for a minute, and Turned the corner and disappeared. As it passed under the streetlight, I caught a glimpse of the license plate in a dull, surprised way, the way you'd grab a feather out of an angel's wing. I bent over the old man and rolled him on his back. He didn't seem to be in pain. He was just an old man with the frightened look of a small boy in a storm. He was breathing hard as I cushioned his head. Please help me. Can you please help me? That's a big order, mister. Oh. Uh. I must talk to you. Well, if you've got any good quotes, you better get them off your chest fast. In my pocket. Inside my pocket. You please put your hand. Yeah. In here? Yeah. Sure. Two envelopes. What about them? One is money. For you. You have the other one? So far. The other one. Please keep sealed. And you will give it to John St. John? John St. John. Yeah. Well, where's he live? I don't understand. It's not... I, I want to tell you. Uh, you don't understand. He was right on that one. I didn't understand a thing, except he slipped out of my arms and stopped paying taxes. I dragged him over the side, and I went through his stuff. There was nothing there. No identification. Just a card with an address out on Haight Street. I opened the envelope and $300 tumbled into my breast pocket. The other one was sealed. There was no name on it, but up in the corner there was some kind of marking. It looked like two crosses spliced together. There wasn't anything I could do for him except pray, and I owe some back dues. So I went back to my office and called police headquarters. I told them where the old man was, and then I checked in the phone book. There was no John St. John listed. Well, it wasn't going to be easy to find him, and I only had two leads. That license number and the address on Haight Street. So I look up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. A good guy, but to him a hangover is the price of being sober. I finally found him singing in a Mason Street bar. Jocko, I want to talk to you. Ah, Patsy, <laughs> you're just in time for the counterpoint. I'm singing a song, a little sentimental thing from my childhood. Yeah, well, little Keith, I got a problem. 
You'll always have a problem, Patsy, because you can't keep out of trouble. You know that, don't you? You have no self-control. All right, Jocko. You have no more self-control than a bucket of mercury dumped on a marble staircase. All right, now, shall we check the bright talk? I just saw a guy get killed. Oh, you, you are like some violent disorder in nature, some large but unprofitable storm. You keep whirling in circles, Patsy. If you ever go more than ten feet in one direction, it's because some woman is nine feet away. Then it begins all over again. Are you all through? Yes. Get to the point. That's another of your troubles. You never get to the point. I just saw a guy killed ten minutes ago. How would that interest me? Are you uh, selling an eyewitness account? Some old guy got killed down on the Embarcadero. He checked out fifteen feet away from me. Who killed him? I don't know. Why do you care? Uh, professional jealousy? Some car came out of nowhere and clipped him. You sure it wasn't an accident? Yeah, just like the Berlin blockade. When you stopped needing me, Jocko, I told you a guy got killed. He was murdered right in front of me. I gotta find a guy called John St. John. How St. John? John St. John. I don't feel like vaudeville tonight, Jocko. The old man gave me $300 to deliver a letter, and I made him a promise. Well, you can break it now with only the slightest risk. I got the license number of the car. Now, I want you to hop down and look it up. And then check at headquarters to see if the guy's got a record, will you? I don't like policemen. They depress me. Check it. I gotta go out to Haight Street. Huh. What kind of neighborhood is it out there? Well, it's not exactly a neighborhood. It's, it's more like an architectural afterthought. A lingering defense against the early California bear. All right, all right. No speeches. Just check on that license plate, huh? Now, if I'm not at my place, try this address. Yes, that's always very interesting at this time of night. Good night, lover. <laughs> Jocko was right about the neighborhood. When I left him, I doubled by my place and left the envelope. I put it inside another envelope and stashed it behind some books, and then I headed out to look up John St. John. Oh, it must have been about midnight when I got there, and it was the kind of a neighborhood where a for rent sign reads like a ransom note. I found the place, though. It was an old rooming house, a third-floor apartment. I knocked at the door, and when she opened it, I knew it was time to wire home for money. A tall, blonde blister with lots of Fahrenheit. He stood there leaning against the door, smiling, looking at you as if you had gold-plated muscles. It gave you a weak feeling where your dinner ought to be. And her voice came right out of the oven. Well, you're out kind of late. Yeah, I'm looking for a guy named John St. John. Oh? Won't you come into my cobweb? Sure. For a spider, you're nice and chubby. Oh, I'm a spider, man. My name's Lee Norton. You want to write it down? I'm Pat Novak. I'm looking for a guy named John St. John. You seem to be running a temperature on the subject. Sit down? Yeah, the couch will do. I'll bet you carry rainy nights in your pocket. All right, now let's get out of the woods, Angel. I'm looking for a guy. I know you're wearing out the pad. I don't know a John St. John. A dead man was carrying around your address. He was? That seems rather futile. Yeah, an old guy about 60. He got killed crossing the street. He should have had a boy scarf then. I don't know anything about him, Mr. Novak. Despite occasional temptations, I don't collect 60-year-old men. Well, he was looking around your address. Why? I don't know. Maybe he admired me from afar like a sunset or something. No, he stopped admiring sunsets about 20 years ago. I see. What are you, the avenging angel? He gave me a sealed envelope. And you were supposed to give it to a man named John St. John. That's right. He gave me 300 bucks to ease the pain. I forget that. You don't look like the charitable type. He was a nice old guy, so I'm going to find his boy. Maybe I can help you. Well, you've got a clear, fast track. Let's see you go. Well, I told you I don't know John St. John, but I'll do this much. Yeah, I know. You're going to be big-hearted and offer to take that letter just in case you ever meet someone named John St. John. What? You brought along your crystal ball. Your hand's shaking, baby. Maybe it's the wind. You better hold it. You need a handrail, friend. Yeah? What are your plans? I'm open-minded about it. Mm-hmm. You're a nice Spider-Man. Yeah. The wind's getting a little worse, isn't it? Yeah. We should act a little more surprised, though. I'm not. When I walked in, I could see you had both arms broken. Did you pay the rent this month? Keep the kettle on. I'll only be a moment. Hello, Lee. If we're early, just give us a magazine. No, come on in. Well, just enough for some bread. You're right. You're only gone for a moment. Who are your friends? Well, I don't sulk. Did they lock the manhole before they left home? His name's Novak. Yeah? That's a pretty name. It don't rhyme with anything, but it's pretty, huh, Joe? Yeah, it's all right. Let's have the letter, Novak. You got hold of a bad rumor, fella. The one I got's good. Let's have it. 
I don't want to strain your mind, Junior, but try to understand. I don't have a letter. Ask him again. Go on home, mister. You're not going to get anything out of me except a small tip. Now, if you're a good boy, I'll give you a nickel for your friend, too. All right, Joe. <laughs> Hold him up. Yeah. Just a minute. He's got a head of hair. Hold him up. <laughs> All right, Mike. That's enough. That's enough. All right, baby. Don't look so sorry. You can't have everything. It's easy to sleep if you got the right friends. When those two gunnips were through, I hit the floor and made Rip Van Winkle look like an insomnia victim. I didn't like the floor, but it was in better shape than my face. I don't know how long I was there, but it must have been a couple of hours. I rolled over once and tried to get up, but it was like trying to barbecue a cake of ice. There was a sick, sweet smell in the room. I tried to place it, but my nose was out on strike, so I went to sleep again. The next thing I knew, it sounded like New Year's Eve. Here you go, Uh, Betsy. uh, Up on the couch. What's the matter? Nothing. If you're you're a kitchen stove, the room's full of gas. Oh. Go to open the window if you're going to turn on the gas. Some of my playmates, I guess. Well, you you weren't at the apartment, so I tried here. Yeah. What time is it? Two o'clock. Who got the quaint idea of the gas chamber? The girlfriend. It was love at first sight. I see. Let's go home to bed. I'm getting used to floors. That old man started a ball game, Jocko. When I mentioned John St. John to this girl, she turned banker and brought in the gunsels. Did she get the letter? I left it at home. Oh, you're getting smart. Yeah. Three hundred dollars worth. They looked at my dough. Well, you couldn't have used it where you were going. Yeah. I've checked on that hit-and-run car. It's listed under the name of Sidney Bronson. Has he got a record? No. <laughs> Everybody's a beginner. Well, let's go home. Oh, it'll be dull, but you'll get used to it. Wait till I wash my hands. Yeah, go ahead. Patsy! Yeah? What did your girlfriend look like? Was she the lively type? Yeah. Why? What's the matter? Because she's not anymore. Yeah, those gunsels play rough. She's kind of pretty. What did she do besides sending out vibrations? I don't know. But she knew all about John St. John. Yes? Yeah. She picked up the bait like a hungry bass. Also, look at that ring. How'd you get around to that? The insignia on it. Oh. The same one that's on that envelope, spliced crosses. Let's go home, Patsy. The police will be here. Yeah, even Hellman will know she's dead. Come on, we better go. On your way out the door, Jocko, try it sideways because I think it's blocked. Hello, Novak. You look pale. It's my color scheme. What do you care, Hellman? None. She looks peaceful. Yeah, I'll be quiet or you'll wake her up. Yeah, I'll tip go. You always cut her throat before she goes to sleep? Who is she, Novak? I don't know. It's awful cozy here for a bunch of perfect strangers. I don't know every dead girl in town, Hellman. You'll have to check. You can still write, can't you, Novak? Hmm? That's all you'll need down at headquarters. Come on. Oh, get out of the haze, Hellman. You don't know who's dead yet, but you're going to book somebody. Yeah. What are you doing up here, appraising the joint? I came up to find a guy named John St. John. She doesn't look like a guy named John St. John. She was my lead. I came up here to smell out a rat. She had a half Nelson on me when two gunsels walked in. They came up to fix the gas meter, I think. You stay out of this. I'll make every effort. Now, if you're smart, you'll fingerprint this place, Hellman. These boys were cute. They've been in somebody's jail. I'll handle my job. You stick to murder. You'll go a long way to pin this on me, Hellman. I can go a long way, Novak. Not with what you got to drag. We get a call in the middle of the night, come up here and find you standing over a dead girl. That's right. And you want me to sprinkle powder all over. Back up and take a better look, Novak. Oh, the view's fine, Hellman, and if you'll take a good look, you'll know why. You haven't got anything to give the DA except a slim lead and a fat hand. You're going to need help. Not on this one. You need help to find the street. Come on back to center, Hellman. Even with both hands, you couldn't find... Yeah? Forget it. So take the medicine like a good boy. I'm not going to walk out and let the two of you tour the town. I'm going to book one or both of you on a murder charge. All right. Look, Jocko, here, then. I love you in a generous mood. you got a string, then, Hellman. Somebody's got to find John St. John. Who's going to find Jocko? Oh, stop worrying. I'll bail you out. You haven't got the right size heart, Novak. You let him die on the vine. Hellman, sometimes you're guilty of unexpected wisdom. I know it's reflex action, but it's consoling anyway. I want you, Novak. I want you bad. I'll take this guy as a down payment, but I'm going to close out with you. Remember that. I will. All right. Come on, mister. Wait a minute. Patsy, you're not going to let him lug me off like this. What else can I do? The guy likes you. It was a bum curve 
have to throw Jocko, but somebody had to dig us out of a hole. Jocko wasn't the boy. He can't shovel dirt with a bar rag. Well, I had no idea where to start. There were two murders, and they were both tied up with this John St. John. He didn't look like a good guy to know. Then there was that insignia, too. The one on the letter and the one on the girl's ring. Sure, it could be a coincidence, but that's what they said about Bluebeard. The only thing I could do was open that letter, so I went back to the apartment. I didn't have to turn on the light. They were running in pairs tonight. She was sitting there on the couch, proud of a pair of long, silk legs, and smiling like a guy who knows he's got a million bucks in the bank. She was blonde, too. A little more lemon juice, maybe, but blonde anyway. She was nice and comfortable, and I got the idea she'd just signed a lease. Good evening. How do you do? Not very well so far. A sly remark, Mr. Novak? No, I'm just bringing you up to date. Your girlfriend's dead. Yes? Yeah. The gas jet's out in the kitchen. It is? I think that's supposed to be mysterious. You clear it up, then. Find a name for yourself and a reason why you picked out my furniture. Oh? Do you mind my being here? I just want to know your name before I throw you out in the hall. Mr. Novak, I'll bet you're awfully slow when it comes to throwing somebody out in the hall. Not if they can bounce as well as I figure you can. When you do throw me out, throw the letter out, too. All right, now, I've already had a dress rehearsal. The answer's no. Well, at least I know where you stand. By the way, why are you standing? Please sit down. Hmm? Yeah. Who's John St. John? Don't be redundant, Mr. Novak. Who is he? If you want that letter, you know him. Don't shout. I'd like you better if you could. I don't need your vote. Who's John St. John? I don't know him. You want that letter because you collect stamps. I want it. And you'll have to take my word. I don't know John St. John. It's worth breaking your heart over. Look, there's a good guy down in the clink sweating on a murder rap for me, so I want John St. John. You've got nice friends. Who's Sidney Bronson? How does that fit into the picture? This started with a waterfront corpse. The leftovers belonged to an old guy that was hit by a car. The car's registered in the name of Sidney Bronson. Mr. Novak, you seem so intense. It's a pity to waste it on random speculation. Now, look, I told you, lady, I got a friend in the jug. Loyalty's a nice trait. One of your nicest. Yeah. You're a pretty thing, Patsy. Let's don't get fooled by the rapper. I'll take a chance. Anybody ever brief you on trouble? Mm-hmm. You're hard to see that far away. Come on over into focus, Patsy. Yeah. You're pretty, Patsy. You look like you're on a bill of sale. I'm a gentle kind, Novak. I'd just like to break your ribs. Go right ahead. I can get a brace. Come here. There. Yeah. What's on your mind? What you're going to say when you find out about this gun? Huh? That's right, sweetheart. My finger isn't hollow. Back up and take a look at the gun. <laughs> you got to that purse, huh? That's right. You've ruined my confidence. I'll give you a testimonial. In the meantime, I want the letter. You go after everything the same way. I want the letter. It's in the desk. Come on. Right here in the top of the door. All right. Go, Stanley. I'm already here, lady. All right, now come on, stop the gun, sis. Let go of my arms now. That's your version. Let go of me. Let go of me. Mm. What was that for? A little something in the house. Now beat it. Well, you've ruined my confidence. You're lucky. Go on home. You won't change your mind about that letter? No. Do it yourself. I'll be going. Oh, Patsy? Yeah? I can't help you on John St. John, but I wouldn't worry about that fellow, Sidney Bronson. Hmm? Why? Because I'm Sidney Bronson. See you soon, Patsy. <laughs> That one sink in for a minute, but it got about as far as my brain and ran out of gas. She wasn't driving that murder car. Otherwise, she wouldn't get that talkie. It began to look like a big, fat, well-fed double-cross, and John St. John was holding up his end. I had to find out what was in that letter, so I made tracks for the bookcase. All I could do was browse, because the letter was gone. Whoever took it didn't even leave a tip. I thought of the girl, but that didn't make sense. And I thought of John St. John. That made lots of sense. Things didn't look rosy for me or Jocko. I was about to buy a file and bake a cake when the phone rang. Yeah. Hello, Novak. Oh, Hillman. The coroner got a report on that dead girl. She died at 12.30. That's pretty close. What's he got, a stopwatch? Fifteen minutes either way. Those fingerprints panned out, too. Yeah? A couple of L.A. strong-arm men. Well, that's new for L.A. You got a call out? We already picked them up. Your favorite's named Welcome Danglers. I could make a joke. I already got one. They're set up with a perfect alibi for 12.30. That means I killed the girl. Nobody's arguing. I, uh, got some more news. Yeah? I'm out at Seal Rock. 
You got the figure for it. We just found an envelope floating around the water. It's one of yours. You better come on out. You found an envelope, so what? So the envelope turns out to be in some guy's pocket. Come on out. <laughs> One thing. Whoever took that envelope out of my place got popular. It was getting late, so I grabbed the cab and rode out to the beach. When I got there, Hellman was standing down near the water. He had Jocko with him. The surf was rolling in, and Jocko wasn't much better. Hello, Patsy. Hiya, Jocko. How's jail? Dry. Thanks for coming, Novak. You're sweet. Where's the envelope? Here. Yeah, the same one. That makes you look good. There was a letter in here. Did you take that with the guy's money, Hellman? You got all there is. This guy on the beach is the third one. It's my opinion the case will solve itself. We're running out of people. Who is the guy? His name's Walter Avery. Here's his stuff. Yeah, what's left? Well, this spliced cross really gets around. Huh? It keeps bobbing up. Here it is on the guy's fountain pen. I'm going to run this guy through the morgue, and then I'm going to look you up, Novak. Yeah? Sure. We want you down with us. That's right, Patsy. I'll introduce you to all the best people. Good night, lover. <laughs> Well, it was close to five, so I tagged by my place for some sleep. I tossed around like a fish on the living room rug. Hellman called about nine to throw more dust in my eyes. He said one of the airlines had a passenger to Portland named Walter Avery. Just to make it tough, the guy made the 12 o'clock plane and got off at Portland. Well, I had left field all to myself. I got dressed and looked up Sidney Bronson's number. There was no answer, so I went over the place was locked, and I looked up the janitor. He wasn't going to let me in, but it turned out his wife had a birthday coming up. Sydney's apartment was real high-powered. I don't know where she got the dough, but I knew I wasn't going to find a tin cup and pencil. What I found was lots better. A card with that same insignia, the spliced cross. The card said, Bellcrest Sanitarium, and down in the corner there was a guy's name, Dr. Emil Schoenig, psychiatrist. Vienna without the walls. The Bellcrest Sanitarium was down near San Carlos. So I borrowed a new Nash from a guy I know and headed down that way. Everything was fine until I got in the front door. They didn't even let me register. I woke up on a couch in Schoenig's office. It was dark outside and my left arm was throbbing like a love story in a woman's magazine. The radiator sitting next to me was Sydney. You're a deep sleeper. Mm-hmm. I think I got some help. What, what happened to my arm? Hypodermic. You only need one arm anyway. In your case, I need a spare. Who did it? Dr. Schoenig. He's a darling boy. Where is he? Out on the phone, trying to figure out what to do with you. What's that make me, a patient? Mm-hmm. That's one way of putting it. You made things easy. We were coming to you for the letter. Huh? You want to try that over again? We were on our way when you stumbled in. You're wrong, Sid. Somebody's giving you a fast pitch. That letter was gone when you were up at my place. I don't want a bum rib, Patsy. I want that letter. You're trailing the field, Angel. I told you, the letter's gone. A guy by the name of Walter Avery took it out of my place. Walter Avery? That's right, and somebody thanked him. They found him this morning making like a dead seal. Walter Avery left for Portland last night. A plant, sweetheart. You better read up on your friends. Yeah. Thanks, Patsy. I told you to watch him, Sid. You had more shots. What's the difference? Uh, none, I suppose. Why don't you mix us a drink while I talk to Mr. Novak? I'll be right with you. Well, Mr. Novak, you're one of my best patients. That's because I like your needles. You better go easy on that drink. Yes? Why? You'll get drunk and run somebody down the way you did that guy on the waterfront. Oh? A good guess. You should be proud. That's a good, sensible, final emotion. Here's your drink, Emil. Thank you, my dear. Is to Mr. Novak. <laughs> Sorry, there's no green for you, Mr. Novak. You probably will be. Huh? Forget it. Emil, I talked to Mr. Novak before you came in. He thinks you're a heel. He does. So do I. Oh, I can stand it. He told me about Walter Avery. I'm sorry about that. Walter got that letter. You killed him and took it. I was supposed to blunder around till you got rid of me, too. That's a bum joke, Emil. You're getting hysterical. With laughter, Emil. You put one of your boys on that plane. Only Novak aired the wash too fast. Suppose I did. Somebody ought to bring you up to date, Sydney. You've been hanging on too long. The free ride's over. I might as well tell you now. You're all through. I can't. The whole bunch of them it. And I'm all through. Scary, Emil. What's the matter with me? What's the matter with me, Sid? Give him a hand, Novak. He just had a bad drink. You wouldn't do that, Sid. I'm full of surprises. 
You got a stomach full of poison. You got a stomach full of poison in 15 seconds, Abel. <coughs> Put down that gun, Amos. I want you to sit. Please, Amos, put down the gun. I will tell you. It's close. <laughs> this happened kind of fast for all of us. What's the noise, huh, Patsy? Yeah. I'll get you a pillow. I'd rather have your lap. You get mercy, not love, baby. Thanks for small favors. Not so good. That was the three and two pitch. Yeah, I had it coming up. I'll tell you about John St. John. I know. There was no such guy. That's right. It was the name of the group. Those spliced crosses? Yes. I found out a little late. It's always that way. That's the way I found out about you. Yeah? I had a funny hunch about you and me. I found out a little late. I know now, Patsy. Does that help? buying and selling government information. That old man tried to tell me, but he checked out too fast. I began to figure something like that when those spliced crosses started showing up. Shoney killed the old man in Sidney's car. He couldn't stop because I was around. The two girls and Walter Avery were both in on the deal. Shoney knew who I was when he saw me go into my office. He tailed me to my place and left Avery there to look for the letter. He killed that girl up in the rooming house, and then he found out she didn't have the letter. When Avery showed up, he took it away from him and threw him to the fish. Shoney was trying to shake Sidney by sending her up to my place after he had the letter. The scheme went haywire when I showed up at the sanitarium. He was trying to work himself out of that one when the payoff came. John St. John? Yeah, right from the start, Jocko said he was either dead or in the state pen. Because anybody with a name like John St. John would have killed his parents as soon as he got old enough to find out about it. Worked out all right. They found the letter out at Schoenig's place. They were some plans for guided missiles and a few other trifles. Well, Hellman asked only one question. How come Schoenig didn't kill me before I could talk to the girl? Well, it's always that way with a guy who commits murder. Either he goes too far or he doesn't go far enough. Service has just brought you Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced by William P. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Asson. Be with us again next week when over most of these same stations we'll bring you Pat Novak for Hire. Pat Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
Welcome back. Well, this episode really broke formula in a few ways, and I, th I think it worked. Um, that uh, Mad Jocko Madigan showed up in record time uh, with this trip to the uh, with this trip over for uh, some booze, and uh, Novak's motivation was entirely uh, different. It was very almost altruistic because he'd gotten the money. And as uh, as uh, Jocko pointed out, he could have just pocketed the money and uh, gone on from there. Um, but uh, he didn't. He definitely did a noble turn here. Uh, so, uh, so it was really impressively done. Uh, but, of course, we get to the same uh, ending where Novak uh, sits back and watches the villains kill each other and then just does the cleanup. Um, well, Hellman, I think, does more of the cleanup, but anyway. Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio, and this week's episode, I'll let George do it. If you got any comments, please send them to me, uh, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, please cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And remember our Facebook page, facebook.greatdetectives.net. Well, we're going to get into today's episode and let George do it, but I wanted to let you know I finished listening to all the episodes of uh, Murder Clinic that are in existence, all six of them, and I have to say it was a phenomenal show. Uh, each episode featured a great detective um, and one of their greatest adventures, uh, and they were all, uh, with maybe one exception, very compelling uh, stories. Uh, some of the, my favorites in here, uh, Madam Story, uh, and Deputy Parr kind of reminded me of Columbo. Uh, and, of course, uh, you had Max Carados, uh, the world's first uh, blind detective. Uh, and, of course, Poirot. Um, the, one, the one guy uh, who, who uh, continued out of the six detectives that we've got samples for, who really has continued to be featured over and over again. The rest of these have been forgotten. But each one of these uh, characters was strong enough. They could have carried a uh, detective story um, all on their own. So these are definitely some ones we'll play as specials, you know, when we have that uh, occasional special like every five months. Uh, but if you'd like to hear some, just go over to archive.org. They've got the entire series. I heartily recommend it. Well, are you ready to have some excitement? Well, good. That's the title of today's episode. I'll let George do it. It's Have Some Excitement. Um, and uh, we'll get into that in just a second. Before we get started, I do want to uh, encourage you as you make your travel plans. Uh, if you're going down to spring training in Florida or Arizona, or you're making a, uh, plans for uh, traveling for a wedding, remember this simple web address, johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com is Priceline.com. So you get all the great benefits of Priceline, great deals on published airfares, hotels, um, car rentals, and cruises, uh, as well as... Uh, the ability to name your own price, plus you get to support great old time radio. So just remember uh, to go to johnnydollarair.com for all your travel needs. But without any further ado, let's get into this week's episode of Let George Do It. Have some excitement. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If it's too hot for you to handle and far off the beaten track, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. My dear sir, if uh, you're a moviegoer at all, you must know me, Peter Murch, the small, ineffectual man everyone laughs at as soon as he appears on the screen. But uh, there's nothing humorous about my present dilemma. After 30 years, I'm to be starred in my next picture. But unless you can help me, I'll have to say no to this dream of a lifetime. This is hard to explain in so many words. 
But if you'll meet me at the Farm Food Vegetarian Restaurant at 1 o'clock today, I'll explain everything. Signed, Urgently, Peter Merch. Oh, sure, Brooksy. You know, that gnome-like character from the movies? Oh, Casper Milk Toast himself. That's the guy. The hand-tech little man who puts galoshes over his rubbers when it rains. <laughs> George Valentine, maker of stars. Hey, I wonder how I fit into this person. Well, I can't wait to find out. Well, then, on to Mr. Merch. Oh, but just one thing, George. Yeah, what's that, Angel? Well, if we have to have lunch at a vegetarian restaurant, could we stop off for a, a hamburger first? <laughs> Veggie burgers. I insist we have veggie burgers for lunch. Veggie burgers? Yes, indeed, Miss Brooks. And if I didn't tell you, you wouldn't know they were made of nuts and choice legumes. Peas, beans... Uh, yeah, I'm uh, sure they're going to be real tasty. But uh, what about your letter? What's on your mind, Mr. Merch? Oh, dear. I knew that letter would sound confusing. To say the least. You see, Mr. Valentine, I had a long talk with my psychoanalyst. And you know what? What? I'm uh, schizophrenic. Oh, no. I'm not one person. I'm two. Battling furiously with each other. Who's winning? I'm not really that mild, retiring little man that millions of people know. No. There's another side of me that craves excitement, even violence. Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Mercer. But it's quite true, young man. My psychoanalyst tells me I just can't go on being a house divided. No. I simply must involve myself in some kind of uh, exciting adventure. Well, what does your doctor expect you to do? Go out and kiss the first beautiful blonde you see on the street? Uh, oh, no, no, no. I'm serious, Mr. Valentine. Look at me. Practically a nervous wreck. I simply can't go on being the prim Peter Merch my public expects of me. When the director says, lights, camera, I begin to shake. So that's the other side of me coming out. Oh, that's bad. Yes, I break into a cold sweat. I, I feel like screaming right out there in front of everybody. Well, maybe all you need is a good scream. No, no, it isn't that simple. My psychoanalyst says I've been playing the timid soul in my personal life as well as on the screen. And it's affecting me. Anyway, I can't go into this new picture. Oh, but Mr. Merch, you've worked so hard all these years. And this is your first starring role. And it would be my first failure, too, in my mental condition. And, uh, you want me to provide the excitement? Yes, Mr. Valentine. Uh, perhaps introduce me to some low, disreputable characters. Uh, take me to places where almost anything can happen, you know. You really think that would help? Well, my psychoanalyst seems to think so. Uh, you will help me, won't you, Mr. Valentine? Well, uh, uh, I'll pay your regular fee and whatever expenses we incur. Uh, well, okay, it's a deal. We'll see what forms of mild excitement we can find for you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Valentine. I'll be grateful to you as long as I live. Uh, can we start now? Oh, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have to make some plans. Uh, what about 8 o'clock tonight? You see, I usually don't go out hunting excitement, Mr. Merch. As a rule, it just happens. Oh, no, George. You're not going to take poor Mr. Merch to Mark Logan's grotto. Well, he wants excitement. Yeah, but not that low dive. He'll faint as soon as he gets in the door. Oh, darling, Mark Logan is a respectable citizen these days. He's gone straight. Yeah, in a crooked sort of way. He's running a genteel pool parlor and so-called grill. And if a fight breaks out now and then, you can't blame Mark. <laughs> Try and hit me with a pool cue, are you? Ah, you had a comedy. I seen you move that number seven ball when you thought I wasn't looking. Why are you... Oh, 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 Mr. Valentine. Oh, my goodness. This will show you. Well, hey, you are, Mr. Merch. Life on the raw. Oh, my, this is exciting. Third brawl in one hour. Just what the doctor ordered. Okay, let the muck get up or beat his brain to you. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you apart. Come on, now, you two lugs. Break it up and get back to your game. I'm running a respectable joint here. Not yet, Logan. Not before I split his skull with his chair. Oh, 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 no. oh, oh. My goodness. Oh, another inch, oh. Mr. Merch, and that chair would have parted your head. Yeah, and permanently. Okay, beat it, both of you. Finish it out in the alley. All right, Logan, it won't take me long. I'll have you look like a pot of hamburger, brother, and I'll forget it. <laughs> you got to excuse him, Mr. Valentine. The boys get kind of playful once in a while. Oh, sure, Mr. Logan. And you lose more pool cues that way. Oh, uh, Mr. Merch, we'd better get out of here before things really get rough. Oh, I wouldn't think of it for a moment. I'm just beginning to feel better. Oh, uh, Mr. Merch. Yes, Mr. Valentine. Here's a nickel. Oh, thank you. 
Why don't you get something on the jukebox over there? I, uh, I want to talk to Mr. Logan a minute. Oh, this is very exciting. Evening out this week. Don't pay no attention to them numbers, Mr. Merch. Wherever you put your nickel, all you get is Mother McCree. That's my favorite. George, I'm afraid we've underestimated our timid soul. You can't get enough. Yeah, and you certainly did your best, Logan. Yeah, which brings up a point, Mr. Valentine. I don't want to be mercenary or nothing like that. Yeah. But there's a question of money. Joe and Alex just now almost killed themselves. There's the mother two fights we framed up. <laughs> okay, Logan. Hey, uh, this ought to take care of the boys. Yeah, thanks. Say, if I knew you was willing to pay this much, I could have fixed up something real messy for the old boy. Oh, that song. Ain't it beautiful? Mother McCree. Yeah, sure. Got any other ideas for excitement, Logan? Well, that little guy don't scare easy. Now, wait. How about this? When you people leave the joint, I'll get the boys to drive up in a big black sedan. Yeah? They grab the little guy and take him out in the country for a spell. <laughs> you mean kidnap him? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't put it that way, Miss Brooks. They lock him in a cellar for a couple of days, keep him tied up. Ain't gonna hurt him, huh? Oh, hey, hold it, Logan. That's going a little too far. Yeah. Eh. I've got an idea. Yeah. And I think it'll work, too. What's that? Here's what you do. You take Mr. Murch out to the seaside amusement park. Oh, after this, a ride on the Ferris wheel is going to leave him cold. Oh, it's nothing like that. You're going to take him through the Tunnel of Love. Oh, Mr. Logan, I'll admit you can find a certain kind of excitement in the Tunnel of Love. But I doubt if Peter Murch is my type. Uh, he was talking to me, Brooks. He's not your type, either. Well, what I was thinking, Mr. Valentine, is uh, I happen to know the guy who runs the Tunnel of Love. His name is Len Dimmick. Oh, goody, George. Maybe we can get a special discount. What I mean is I'll call up Len and have him take the trip through the tunnel with you, personal. He's one of them practical jokers, so he'll play along with the gig. Now, dream up a couple of stunts. Leave it to Len to find a way to scare the pants off here, Mr. Merch. Well, it's worth a try, Logan, and the night's getting shorter. i got to earn my fee. If you want to get out of that amusement park quick, better take Walton Boulevard. They're tearing up Grayson Avenue. Okay, thanks a lot, Logan. Oh, Mr. Merch. Hmm? Yes, Mr. Valentine? Uh, if you can drag yourself away from Mother McCree, we'd like you to join us in a blood-curdling journey through the Tunnel of Love. Oh, just think of it. The three of us, alone, together. This should be real exciting. Nice racket you got here, Jimmy. Selling five minutes worth of darkness? Darkness is a valuable commodity, Mr. Valentine. It... it is? Yeah. Just like I was telling Mr. Murch here. Well, a after all those gruesome things you've been telling us, I, I don't think I want to hear any more. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Murch. Stomach is right. Now, could you find a cozier place for a murder than a tunnel of love? Yeah, that reminds me. I remember a happy couple who took a ride through here just for a little innocent smoochie. And then... Yes? Suddenly, death struck a silent... I, uh, I wish we had some light in here. What? In the Tunnel of Love? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that, Jimmy. It was an unsolved crime, wasn't it? Often wondered how the poor man was killed. And how the young lady felt when she heard him scream. Here, in the darkness. <laughs> oh, oh, Mr. Dimmick. What was that? Oh, one of the many voices of darkness that echo through the tunnel of love. Just calm yourself, Mr. Murch. Well, <laughs> I wasn't really frightened at all, Mr. Valentine. Uh -huh. You're a brave man, Mr. Murch. Nobody knows what the next step into the darkness may lead to. Nobody knows... Oh. Mr. Denning! <laughs> I think our friend missed his profession. He should have been an actor. Mr. Valentine... Mr. Dimmick, I... I think he's fainted. Huh? Fainted? And his hair. Uh, I think it's blood. Oh, what are you talking about? Uh, uh, Wait. My... My head. Let me get some... George, he's not there. I'll light a match. Uh, look at him. Yeah. We've got to get him out of here. Get him to a hospital. Uh, in, in, in my... 
Well, he, he's trying to say well, something to you, Mr. Valentine. Well, look, what is it? What are you trying to say? Pete, in my pocket. Oh. Transfer. Yeah, yeah. Take it. Bus. Transfer. Hold. Huh? We'll get a doctor, Mr. Dimmick. He'll take care of you. Here, strike another match, will you, Mr. Merch? He, he, he can't guess. Uh, yeah, I don't think Dimmick has much use for a doctor now, Brooksy. George. But, Mr. Valentine, this can't be true. Why, the things like this simply don't happen. I'm afraid this is an exception to the rule, Mr. Merch. Dimmick's been murdered. <laughs> We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about how to be kind to your starter. It's often the little things that make your day a good one or a rough one. The simple business of starting your car, for example. If it's obstinate and gives you a bad time when you want to get going, it can add up to a lot of irritation. For fast starts every time and wherever you're driving, just try Chevron Supreme gasoline in your car. This premium quality gasoline is climate-tailored, specially adapted to each different climate and altitude zone in the West. Day or night, summer or winter, you can depend upon it for fast starts. And that's a saving, too, of the power in your battery. What's more, Chevron Supreme gives your car smooth acceleration and extra power for rugged hills. Get a tank full tomorrow at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Now, back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, here's the situation. You take on a cockeyed job because that happens to be your business. A character actor wants you to provide him with some excitement because his psychoanalyst told him he's been playing the meek, timid type so long, it's beginning to affect his work. So, you give Peter Murch a ride for his money, including a ride through the tunnel of love in an amusement park. And then, murder strikes in the darkness. Valentine? Yeah, Lieutenant Riley. Usually people manage to get killed in bed, in their home, or on the street. But Dimmick gets murdered in his own tunnel of love. And you're right there with him. Oh, I know it sounds fantastic, Lieutenant. But believe me, we were just trying to introduce a little excitement into Mr. Murch's life. That's right. He was all very innocent. Ah. Oh, well, how was George to know anything like this would happen? Miss Brooks, I'm just a public servant. I get paid a reasonable sum each month to maintain law and order. And I don't like it when somebody gets paid to promote pool room brawls and instigate other forms of public disturbance. All right, stop quoting the police, man. Your lieutenant. Yeah. Whatever happened here tonight would have happened whether I was in on this deal or not. It's just that my psychoanalyst Mr. said... Mr. Murch, uh, why don't you go somewhere and have a nice, quiet, nervous breakdown? Uh, my when I'm, I'm through here, I'll come and join you. Uh, murder in the tunnel of love. Oh, lieutenant. Yes, Brennan. The doc just got through with Dimmick. Skull fracture. Blunt instrument. All right, I'll be right there. Uh, tell the boys to get some lights set up in that tunnel. We're going to go over it inch by inch. Yes, sir. Now, Valentine, I suppose you're going to go home to your nice warm bed. Oh, well, I'll be glad to stick around, give you a hand. No, 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 thanks, thanks. I've got enough trouble. But I want to see you the first thing in the morning in my office. Sure. And you too, Miss Brooks. Yes. And Mr. Murch. Uh, yeah, yes. It uh, might give you a little extra excitement to see the inside of a police station. So be there at nine sharp. But looks like we're not wanted around here, so uh, come on, Mr. Murch. I still think I ought to drop you off at your hotel, Mr. Murch. Yes, you've had enough for one night. Well, uh, my wife and I are staying at the Fenmore right here on Grayson Avenue. But I can tell, Mr. Valentine, you're not just giving up this case like that. Oh, no. You're up to something, aren't you? Well, well, yeah, you stirred up a hornet's nest somehow or other, and I want to see what it's all about. And I'm going to be right there with you. Oh, hey, no, 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 there's no use arguing. George? Yeah, Brooksy? Well, that part of a bus transfer Dimmick wanted you to have, what do you make of it? I don't know yet. Well, why should anyone keep a piece of old transfer? Now, that's probably one of the most worthless things in the world. And only a third of a transfer at that. Well, that man insisted that you have it with his dying breath. Must mean something. Yeah, well, we'll see what the lieutenant makes out of it. I gave it to him. Told him what Dimmick said. But you've made something out of it already, haven't you, Doc? Come on, let's have it. Uh, 
Well, as a matter of fact, you can you can tell a lot from a bus transfer, Brooksy. Even a third of a one, if you look at it real careful like. Meaning what? That it was issued by the Orange Bus Company, route number 411. And the little punch holes, one for the year, one for the month, and even the day and the hours during which it was good. Did you, you noticed all those things? That transfer was issued July 29th, 1943, between the hours of 4 and 6 p.m. All of which still means nothing to me. Oh, me either at this point. But I have an idea that late Mr. Dimmick meant it to provide free transportation for his murderer to the end of the line. Hey, why are we turning off, George? Where are we going? <laughs> hey, you know something, Brooksy? Riley and I don't always agree, but he knows his business, and so do his boys. We're going down to police headquarters. Well, what for, Mr. Valentine? The police don't miss much, and when they do, they make a record of it so they'll never forget. And that's where we're headed, Mr. Murch, the Department of Unsolved Crimes. Valentine. Yeah, and this time I brought you a container of coffee, Dawson. Thought you'd need it. Well, the sleepier we can get down in this department, the better we like it. <laughs> Who are your friends? Oh, my assistant, Miss Brooks and Mr. Murch. Uh-huh. How do you do? What do you want, Valentine? You know these files aren't open to the public. Well, I'm not just the public, Dawson. Uh, your boss, Riley, told me to be down here tomorrow morning and be sure I had the right information. He said that? Well, oh, sure, go on. Call him up. Check for yourself. Oh, uh, no, as long as he said so. What do you want to know? If there were any unsolved crimes on July 29th, 1943. July 43, let's see. Oh, it's that file in the corner near the window. Okay, mm-hmm. thanks. Uh, just uh, what are you looking for, Mr. Valentine? The murderer, I hope. You and I ought to be used to being left in the dark, Mr. Murch. Let's see. Yeah, July 1943. Let's see what we got in this world. Stolen car, front of Grant and Company. Burglary and... Yes? And on July 29th, 5.35 p.m., $200,000 jewel robbery at Smith and Allenby Jewelers on 5th Street. The date on the transfer. Uh Uh-huh. And that picture. That's our Mr. Dimmick. Leonard Dimmick, 38, clerk at Smith and Allenby's. No suspicion of collusion and holdup. But Dimmick was operating a tunnel of love. A lot of things can happen in a man's life in five years, Brooksy. Let's see that, George. No getaway car used in robbery as far as known. Passerby observed man in gray suit carrying briefcase board orange bus outside jewelry store almost immediately after holdup. Witness positive man was running from store. Oh, dear me. This is just too much for me. Trace bus driver number 602, but no information on man in gray suit. Well, that's that, kids. Now we've really got to work fast. What's the rush, George? If we don't move fast, Brooksy, there's going to be another murder. <laughs> Mr. Valentine, as I told you, this is the busiest time of the day for us here at the depot. You know, getting the buses out on schedule. Yeah, I, I understand, Mr. Eldridge. But look, this is very important. Who was your bus driver, number 602, on July 29th, 1943? Oh, very well. If you can't wait, I'll look it up for you. You see, uh, we have a file here on every man who ever worked for us. Uh-huh. 44, 43, July the 29th. Oh, yeah, here we are. Yeah. Yeah, number 602. It was, uh, it was a Bob Gray. Still work for you? Oh, yeah, Bob's still with us. As a matter of fact, he's one of our steadiest men. There's nothing wrong, is there? I don't know yet. Well, where can I get hold of Mr. Graves? Why, yeah, I don't know. This is day off. All right, what's his address? Come on, come on. Uh, 1411 Dever Street. One four one one. Looks like a rooming house. Yeah, with the inevitable sign. No room. Could, I, could you take these steps a little slower, please? Oh, oh Mr. Murch, I almost forgot about you. Well, I, I'm not just as young as I used to be. Who is? <laughs> but right now, I'm interested in seeing that someone else has a chance to grow a little older. Wait a minute, George. There's a name here under this bell. What does it say? Uh... Bob Gray. That's our man. But uh, who is Bob Gray? An honest toiler, Mr. Murch. To be more specific, a bus driver. To be more specific, bus driver number 602, who had a very busy day, July 29th, 1943. Yeah, who is it? A friend of yours sent me over to talk to you, Graves. Go on, Petey, get out of here. Okay, Bob. But Len Dimmick wouldn't like the way you treat me. What'd you say? Who are you? 
There's nothing much I can say with that gun stuck in my midriff. Never mind that. Who are these two? Just friends. What do you say we go inside and close the door? It'll be much easier that way. Okay. But what's this about Dimmick? Come on, come on, talk. I wish he wouldn't keep pointing that gun. It makes me nervous. <sighs> nothing like excitement, is there, Mr. Murch? Look, mister, you said something about Dimmick. What about him? He's dead. He's... So what? You bringing me an invitation to his funeral? No. I'm just trying to postpone your funeral. What's that supposed to mean? Just this, listen. You're going to have a visitor any time now. I'm surprised he hasn't shown up before. I still say what's that supposed to mean? All right, friend, if that's your attitude. And I thought you had to have some brains to be a bus driver. How do you know so much about me? And being a bus driver, you should appreciate the value of a transfer. Even a piece of a transfer. Transfer? That's right. All right, spill it. And remember, I got this gun in your gut. George, be careful. Don't worry, Brooks. He's much too curious to shoot. Yes, but that gun may go off accidentally. Who's that? Did you bring the cops? I didn't bring anybody. That's your visitor. What? Cool down your trigger finger and listen to me. What's this all about? Are you a cop? I'm strictly on my own. But if I'm right, whoever's knocking on that door is here to kill you. I'm not kidding. Now. Well. And no one knows it better than you. You gonna do as I tell you? Oh. All right. Brooksy, you and Mr. Merch get over there in that corner. Wait the door. Make it snap. Yes, George. Come on, Mr. Merch. Uh, Graves, open up. Try to be natural. Put that gun away. Yeah, yeah. I'll be standing right here in back of the door. I was beginning to think you were out. Uh, you know how it is, Logan. My day off. I guess I fell asleep. Awful thing happened to Len Dimmick, didn't it? Yeah, I heard about it. Come inside, huh? And just when we were going to split everything three ways. Yeah, that's right. That makes the gravy all the richer for you and me, don't it? I don't get it. And if there was only one, there'd be nothing but gravy left. What are you talking about? You want me to interpret? Valentine, you... What Logan means, Graves, is he was going to kill you just as he killed Dimmick. Now you're out of your mind. Maybe, but you killed Len Dimmick. When I heard about Len, I thought it was something like that. Don't listen to him, Bob. You were just too clumsy about it, Logan. I took Grayson Avenue coming back. It wasn't torn up at all the way you said. So what? You sent us the long way so you could get to the Tunnel of Love before us. That's right, George. And he'd be the only one to know that Dimmick would be inside the Tunnel of Love with us. He arranged the whole thing. Oh, my goodness. You sneaked into the Tunnel before us, Logan. You were waiting on the platform for the boat to pass. Yes, but in, in the darkness, it could it could have been me. I could have had my head bashed in. I I don't think I feel so good. No, it wouldn't have been you, Mr. Murch. Len Dimmick was doing all the talking. Made himself the perfect target. Graves, you're not going to believe this guy, are you? Yeah, I believe him. You killed Len and you came here to kill me so you could have all the grave you was talking about. Put that gun down, Bob. Put it down. Double cross me, will you? Yeah, let me have that grave. You've got a big enough rap against you now. George, let go. He, he shot Mr. Logan. And the first one who moves will get what he got. Come getting out. Stay where you are. Drop that gun. Huh? I said drop it. That's better. Oh, it's the drive. Glad to see you, Lieutenant. Sergeant Dawson called and said you were snooping around the unsolved crimes department, so I had you tailed. Now, who's this guy on the floor here? How bad's he hurt? My, my arm. You should have blown your head off. Brennan, get this man out of here to a hospital, whoever he is. That's Mark Logan, Lieutenant. Ex-con. Now runs a pool parlor. Now, what's this all about? Well, Logan's one end of a triangle. Len Dimmick, former jewelry clerk, was the second. And Graves here, bus driver, is the third. They're the trio who waltzed through that Smith and Allenby job back in 43. How do you know all of this, Valentine? Lieutenant, I think that if you go through Logan's clothes when he gets to the hospital, you'll find a third of a bus transfer on him. Wouldn't you say so, Graves? I, uh... Uh, why not? Sure, we pulled that job, the three of us. Dimmick, Logan, and me. We decided to wait five years because the jewels were too hot to touch right away. Where are they now? Buried under the water in a tunnel of love. But uh, those uh, transfers... Yes, what about them? Uh, lots of things can happen in five years. Guy can die, get put in jail. So we decided whoever showed up with a third of the transfer from my bus would get his share. Valentine, how did you stumble onto graves? Well, Lieutenant, why a third of a transfer? Why not a quarter or a half? I knew about Dimmick and Logan. That makes two. But there was still one more to account for. I get it, and it had to be the bus driver. That's right, Brooksy. They wouldn't leave their getaway to chance. And they were sure the bus would be right there at the exact minute. Well, I'll be... Almost $70,000 for a third of an old transfer. No wonder Logan was willing to go to all that trouble to get rid of Dimmick and Graves. Well, is that enough excitement for you, Mr. Murch? Mr. Murch! What's the matter, Brooks? He... he's fainted.
Well, here we are, Mr. Murch. Feeling better? Here's your hotel, Mr. Murch. <laughs> I, I don't know what you think about me mm. painting like that, but I really do feel like a new man. My psychoanalyst was so right. Think you're up to playing that star role now? Oh, yes, of course. And now that I'm convinced I'm the swaggering, masterful type of heart. Good for you, Mr. Murch. Oh, uh, uh oh, just one thing. Yes? Would uh, you two mind coming upstairs with me? But why? I, I stayed out so much later than I promised. Oh? Hmm? You see, Mrs. Murch is such a forceful personality. If you're planning a motoring trip, here's something you should do to make it a safe trip. Stop in at a standard station or independent Chevron gas station before you start out and have your tires inspected. If you find they're worn smooth, have risky cuts or bruises, don't take a chance. Play safe and get a new set of grip-safe Atlas tires. The wider, skid-resisting Atlas tread gives you greater driving protection. There's more rubber to grip the road to give you quick, safe stops and absorb road shocks. With each new Atlas passenger tire, you get a full year's written warranty against damage to the tire from road hazards. No wonder Atlas is the tire known nationally for its safety, long life, and economy. Another tip, when you're on the open road, keep safe by keeping the right amount of air in each tire. And that's a job for the folks at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear Lieutenant Riley saying, Look, Miss Brooks, my feet hurt. Let's get back to the house. Oh, hmm? please, Lieutenant. George and Maude have been away so long, I'm really worried. Let's take one look up here in the lemon grove. Well, all right. Wait till I put the flashlight on. Look, over there. Valentine. George. Oh. Hello, everybody. I was just thinking of getting up anyway. Ooh. Somebody must have been staging an atomic test around here. Hey, where's Marta? Here's your answer, Valentine. She's right over here, but uh, no hurry. She couldn't move if she tried. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Louis Van Ruten as Mr. Murch, Joe Duvall as Logan, Paul Fries as Dimmick, Arnie Phillips as Graves, and Dick Ryan as the manager. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Welcome back. What a good episode. Uh, in some ways, this episode was a little bit of a uh, returning to kind of uh, uh, mystery with the com- comedic element in it. I think some of the early shows, they really overdid the comedy at the expense uh, that it wasn't a detective story by the time it was done. This one, I, I thought they had some nice comedy in there. And uh, they also had uh, some just fantastic, uh, fantastic story. So they did this well, and I have to say about Brooksy's request um, uh, re- request to go, 
uh, and get a hamburger before going to the vegetarian place. That is the that's the right kind kind of girl, if you ask me. Um, right kind of woman. Um, I uh, <coughs> I did wanted to comment a little bit on the guest stars. Because uh, one thing that made Let George Do It fascinating um, was the guest stars they got on. And the people they had in the cast over and over again. And you heard some of those names at the end. We'll talk about them a little uh, briefly. Barney Phillips was in the cast. And if you've listened to Dragnet, you know uh, Barney Phillips uh, played uh, Joe Friday's partner in several other roles on that show. He was also in um, uh, Nero Wolf. Uh, Louis, uh, Louis Van Rooten. Louis Van Rooten, uh, actually is, is kind of, uh, kind of interesting. Dennis at the Digital Deli, uh, has got him amongst the radio, uh, biographies. And he said, and he writes that between 1938 and 62, virtually the entire span of the golden age of radio, Louis Van Rooten's name appears in the credits of every significant radio program within the 25 year span. And actually, because what he tries to do, uh, what Dennis tries to do, is to list every single um, radio appearance, uh, like every show they appeared on. It's a great resource. And what he's actually got on Van Rooten, uh, it illustrates kind of the challenge of trying to, to chronicle his whole career. He gets down to 1949 with the adventures of Philip Marlowe, and he just writes, and hundreds more. Um, and uh, he, we'll get to hear him a little later uh, in his one episode in existence of Nero Wolf. Uh, then another name, Paul Freeze. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Paul Freeze. Um, uh, you probably don't recognize the name, but if I tell you about his work, there's no doubt you've heard him. Um, of course, on radio, he was the Green Llama for a summer replacement series. But most of us remember him as Professor Ludwig von Drake, as Boris Badenov. He worked for nine animation studios um, and played so many roles. Um, according to IMDb, they give him about 370 credits um, for, for television and movies. And uh, th this interesting tidbit Dennis uh, found, uh, Dennis found uh, a college study once determined that so ubiquitous was Paul Free's voice work during the 1960s and 70s that was, there was not literally one day of television or radio during that period in which Paul Free's voice was not heard. Uh, phenomenal. Um, absolutely phenomenal. And really, it's the, these kind of what you might consider bit players uh, that made uh, these great shows uh, possible, particularly with Let George Do It. They were particularly adept at getting fantastic talent to back up uh, their shows. So... Just a little bit about the actors. I've uh, got a couple comments on Podcast Alley, and I encourage you to ca uh, cast your vote for Podca um, Podcast Alley. Comments are much appreciated, but they are not required to vote. One listener gives me a double A plus several pluses over on Podcast Alley. Li another writes, like the extra info on the program. Highly recommend and great fun show and enjoy some of the old adverbs. Uh, well, thank you so much for your comments uh, and for all your support. Thanks for all the votes. Um, again, fantastic on keeping the show ranked so high on Podcast Alley. If you've not cast your vote, though, please do so, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And remember to email me your uh, thoughts on the show to box13 at greatdetectives.net. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you this week's episode of Sherlock Holmes. Got any comments? Email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Please cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley. Um, again, the votes are much appreciated. We've had some really high standings, particularly for a show that's less than four months old. Uh, please go and cast your vote, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And remember our listener survey, survey.greatdetectives.net. What made the uh, 
this particular uh, incarnation of Sherlock Holmes, the Rathbone Bruce episodes work was, uh, to me, I think, is the chemistry between Rathbone and Bruce. Uh, and uh, uh, because they were real life friends. And one of the interesting tidbits I found over at basilrathbone.net was a little bit of an excerpt from Nigel Bruce's autobiography. Um, and he actually got a, um, he got a telegram from Rathbone, um, right before, uh, right after he'd had a failure of a play, The Night of Song. Uh, the telegram was from Basil Rathbone, who said, Do come back to Hollywood, Willie dear boy, and play Dr. Watson to my Sherlock Holmes. We'll have great fun together. Basil can never realize how much that telegram cheered me up, as when I received it, I was in the mood to put my head in a gas oven. Our Sherlock Holmes pictures took between 18 and 22 days to make. Often we shot out of continuity. The moment one sequence was ended, the scenery would be torn down in the next same stages for a completely new setup. We learned our entire parts before the picture commenced, as one does for a stage play. That meant we had no worries if the shooting schedule were changed and if the story was told out of its continuity. Roy Neal was always open to suggestions from Basil or myself, and we always accompanied him to daily rushes in the projection room. Uh, Roy, uh, Basil, uh, myself, and our Sherlock Holmes cast worked together as a happy and contented team. Uh, and of the radio program, he writes... Uh, we all got on like a house uh, on fire. Not only is Basil Rathbone a very dear friend, but he's one of the most unselfish and generous actors with whom it has ever been my pleasure to act. We had a great time together on the program and spent many hours playing golf at Riviera or Bel Air. Basil and I were evenly matched, both of us having handicaps of 10. In December of 1944, we took our radio program to Santa Barbara where we raised $190,000 for the war bond drive. From there, we traveled to San Francisco for the sixth war loan drive. We spoke at numerous bond rallies, signed autographs, and sold bonds in two of the city's largest shops, met with the popular Mayor Lapham of San Francisco, and with him visited the police headquarters, where we, t where we sold a bond to the chief of police, Charles DeLea. Here we also were also shown many interesting relics of crime, and Basil caused a lot of laughter when he told the chief that he was sorry to hear that they still had so, some unsolved crimes in San Francisco, as he and I solved every case we handled with the greatest of ease once every week on Friday nights, and each case took us half an hour. Uh, and he writes about, um, Holmes, uh, about Rathbone going back to the theater, um, and... Uh, he said basically he, he, uh, he decided to go to the stage which he always preferred and on which he could play parts of his own choosing. My association with Basil had been a very long one. We had acted together in 14 Sherlock Holmes pictures in the film of Frenchman's Creek and on the radio in countless programs since October 2nd, 1939. Ours had been a very pleasant association and one which has brought me much publicity and a lot of money. During our time together, Basil and I never had it a row, or any unpleasantness of any sort. I never worked with a nicer man than Basil, and I never acted with a more unselfish or more cooperative actor. So, really, great. I, I think that explains what makes the show work so well and the source of the great chemistry between these two guys. Um, we'll get into today's episode of Sherlock Holmes, The Superfluous Pearl, in just a moment. But uh, I do want to remind you, as you make your plans uh, for the new year, and uh, you're looking at starting a new business, uh, you're, you're going to want to start a very nice personal website, well, just remember um, our host, the world's number one host, one and one Go to hosting.greatdetectives.net and find great deals on hosting and support the great detectives of old-time radio. Well, we're going to get into today's episode, uh, Superfluous Pearl. Now, I'm going to make some apology uh, up front, because I, uh, on the Dragnet show, uh, cut commercials. Well, I did not cut or edit this episode. The way it's played is basically the way I found it. Um, and I think this was probably a home recording, and whoever recorded it, uh, they just recorded the plot. Um, so we've got no introduction, we've got no 
um, outro, and we've got no commercials. Uh, but but the plot is pretty much uh, intact. Uh, the beginning's a little abrupt uh, because there's no opening, uh, but just bear with it. Uh, there's uh, there's none of the plot, uh, as far as I can tell from here, that's missing. So let's go ahead and get into today's episode, The Superfluous Pearl. Town was full of bevies of fresh young beauties, brought up from the country to be presented at court. The papers were full of accounts of dinners, forays, garden parties, and all the rest, of what now seems like a forgotten life. Naturally, all this meant very little to home. Consequently... I was more than a bit surprised on returning one afternoon to our Baker Street lodgings to find him deep in a veritable snow drift of illustrated society magazines and papers. Watson, do you know about this man, Damery? 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 What Damery? Lord Damery, of course. He took his photograph and all the society we see. Oh, that's true. The fellow's a household word in society. Mm, yes. He's a man of the world of a bachelor turned to the storm again and asked me for a four thirty appointment with that granted. You mean that the uh, old dame is coming here? It's four thirty now. And look at the mess of the place to him. That is Mrs. Hudson. Well, the dame is not saying a visit to Baker Street to investigate our housekeeping, but to consult me in my professional capacity. Ah. That will be the gentleman now, and if I'm very much mistaken, punctual to the minute. Take a look out of the window, will you, Watson? That's a good fellow. Oh, really, very um, why you always expect me to play Sister Anne for you? Oh, all right, very well. Yes, yes, Mrs. Hudson, he's up in the door to him. I choose he's up in the front step, making his kiss. Oh, my kiss, Donna. If he's a movie, he's hat and by. His lordship must have got a very expensive tailor. Every detail, from his black satin cravat to his Satan ever shoes, is perfect. I say, I must have cost him. Really, an unmarried man, our Lord Damery. Why do you say that, Holmes? Huh? Not only a bachelor squanders money on his wardrobe to settle his hand, the married man is too busy putting his wife's bills for feathers and Oh, servos. but it's worth it, my dear fellow. It's worth it, the pleasure of seeing the lady of one's choice, an affecting new bonnet, or an agitating chip in my ear. You a rhapsody, my dear Watson. Our huh? visitor is just not my door. Come in. Ah, oh, Lord Damery, I presume. And this must be the celebrated Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> I'm delighted to make your acquaintance. Won't you sit down, sir? Watson, dump that encyclopedia off the other armchair, will you? Ah, uh, yes, sir. I was hoping to find Dr. Watson. A pleasure, I assure you. Well, the pleasure is mine, sir. Yes, I'm truly delighted to find Dr. Watson present. This collaboration may be very necessary, Mr. Holmes. We are dealing on this occasion with one of the most ruthless individuals in all England. Oh, and who might that be? My sister, the Lady Alicia, <laughs> widow of the late Earl of Devon. <laughs> you don't say. Yes, she has the well-known whim of iron. Anyone who crosses her in any way is in grave danger. You mean that she'd go as far as to poison them or, or knife them in the back? Ladies in high society, my dear Dr. Watson, have more subtle but nonetheless deadly ways of dealing with their adversaries. <laughs> and for whom is uh, the Lady Alicia sharpening her knife this time? Well, I suspect it's Miss Kitty Kissam. Kitty Kissam? You mean the delightful Kitty Kissam, the star of the... Sweetheart of the regiment? The same. And how did Lady Alicia's path happen to cross the uh, charming kitty? Through my dunce of a nephew, Percy, who also happens to be Alicia's only son. Oh, oh. you've become uh, infatuated with this kitty? He's asked her to marry him. And uh, quite, uh, well, quite naturally, his, his mother objects. No, that's the most startling aspect of the whole affair. As soon as I heard of the engagement, I rushed round, expecting to find Alicia in the midst of hysterics or... <laughs> At least having taken to her bed surrounded with smelling salts. And uh, such is not the case. No, on the contrary. She was sitting at her desk in the morning room, making out her list for a reception and music hall to be given tomorrow afternoon to honor Miss Kissam. Lord and Lady Coverdale, the Duke of Rockington, Lady Windermere. Well, I must say, my dear Alicia, I hardly expect to find you in such a cheerful mood. Why not? After all, what this family needs is new blood. They tell me dear Kitty's father was a butcher and her mother a barmaid. Yes, I'm sure Percy should be very, very happy with the dear little thing. She's bound to make a big impression on all our friends. Alicia, I don't like the way you say that. You have a, a, a certain glint in your eye. What glint, dear? The glimpse you had the evening you met the lady of Stacey de Vere at the top of the grand staircase at Buckingham Palace. <laughs> yes, we've been quarreling all the winter. It's such fun. Yes, you smiled politely and left that sweet color. Then you deliberately stepped on her chain, ripping it off at the waist, revealing the fact that she wore certain uh, 
red flannel undergarment. <laughs> Dear Eustasia, she was the laughing stuff at Mayfair. I warn you, Alicia, Kitty Kissam is no Lady Eustasia. Of course not, darling. She's no lady at all. That's what makes me so anxious to have our friends meet her. <laughs> Like a rather ominous situation, or Damery. By the way, do I gather that you have the pleasure of this person's acquaintance? Uh, well, that is, uh, yes, in a way. We we partaken of a bottle and a bird several times, don't you know, after the theater. It is really a dear little thing, in, in spite of her reputation. Reputation? Well, surely you've heard of her confounded pose. I'm afraid I'm rather ignorant of the uh, chit-chat of our metropolis. But everyone knows that she was given those dashed pearls by a certain Balkan king who spends most of his time in Paris. She wears them constantly, Luncheon, for tea, for dinner, in and out of the theater. <laughs> I believe she even wears them in her bath. Mm. Mm. And what, um, they're a sort of trademark. Yes, I suppose you might call it that. It's the only evidence of bad taste I've ever known Kitty to indulge in. Bad taste? Well, confounded man, you're going to take a woman to go flaunting her. Well, her past about as if you were proud of it. Not even if it um, packs the theater? Oh, blast those clothes. I suspect that whatever my sister has up her sleeve concerns them. Oh. Well, for one thing... She insists I hire a private detective to keep an eye on them. Says she doesn't want to run the risk of having them stolen in her house. Very solicitors of her. Eh, hey, Watson? Why not solve the whole situation by suggesting to Miss Kitty that she leave her jewels at home? Black five. Yeah. And, uh, well, there are times when Kitty Kissing can be as difficult as my sister. She oh. absolutely refuses. She says she would as soon appear in public without her petticoats as without her pose. I've warned her that my sister Alicia means business. But she says no... Ron Darm is going to get the better of her. Oh, an interesting situation, eh, Watson? It reminds me of society's leading oh. hostesses in conflict with um, one of the theater's most popular leading ladies. Well, I've been trying to bet on Miss Kitty. <laughs> you don't know my sister, Alicia. What makes you so positive that your sister is still opposed to the match between your nephew and Miss Kitty? Because in the first place, Percy can't afford to marry an actor. He has no money and is quite incapable of earning a living. My sister had a match practically arranged between him and Lord Beaverbottom's oldest daughter. He's the millionaire, you know. And in the second place, Kitty must be a good ten years older than the boy. Well, she doesn't look like it. No, she's an actress. In oh, yes. short, you, um, you don't prove of the match, but uh, you'd hate to see your sister put one over on Miss Kitty Kissam. <laughs> That's the situation in the nutshell. Now, I, I beg of you, Mr. Holmes, come and keep an eye on things. Ostensibly, you'll be there to guard these silly pills, but in reality, I want you to, well, prevent any unpleasantness that might harm Miss Kissam's professional popularity. After all, she's a bad fine actress, you know. Yes, yes, and an equally delightful supper partner, eh? I warn you, my dear, that if anything uh, awkward happens to Kitty, uh, Miss Kissam, at this party of yours, I shall cut Percy out of my will. He won't get a penny from me. And then where would you be? <laughs> my dear James, calm yourself. Anyone might think that it was you who'd become engaged to Miss Kissam instead of Percy. Besides, if Percy has to wait till you pop off, my dear, before he inherits the family wealth, I'll be dead and gone. You're too disgustingly young and healthy. Uh, it's no good trying to butter me up, Alicia. And I wish to remind you that it's not the family wealth Percy will inherit. It's my money, my own. I made it myself, and I shall leave it to whom I please. Of course you will, James. But we Damerys are famous for sticking together, aren't we, too? Oh, look. Who is the mean, rapacious, and uh, very distinguished man who just entered? Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Walker. Oh, uh, these are the gentlemen I've asked to guard Miss Kissam's pearls. And, and I warn you, Alicia, Sherlock Holmes has the best brain in England, so no monkey tricks. Don't be vulgar, James, my pet. Ah, oh, they see you. Coming over. And all of a flutter. Ah, oh, Mr. Holmes, it's so good of you to be so prompt. The guest of honor is you at any moment. Good evening, Lord Emery. Uh, James, my darling, haven't you forgotten something? Hmm? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Alicia, my dear, may I introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes and his friend and colleague, Dr. Watson? How do you How do? How do you do, madam? This is really delightful. I was just saying to Lord Damery, Mr. Holmes, that I had no idea a member of the police force could look so perfectly fascinating. I'm sorry to disappoint you, ma'am, but uh, we are not members of the official police. We are merely amateurs of the not-so-gentle art of detection. How charming. How simply charming. Kitty Kissam. Oh, oh. oh, here's my guest of honor now. Hmm. Judging by the rush in her direction, it seems that quite a few of my male guests have already had the privilege of meeting her. Yes, you see, uh, they no longer lock actresses up in the wardrobe front after the performance, lady. Mm, yes, I think she's wearing her pearls. They certainly are magnificent, almost as fine as mine, I should say. 
We don't suppose she insists on wearing them so consistently because her neck is too skinny. No one could ever suspect you were that man. <laughs> Touche, Alicia. He had you there. Don't be unpleasant, James. Come along, Mr. Holmes. You too, Dr. Uh, Wilson. Uh, what? what? Oh, of course, to be sure. After all, if you're to stand guard over Miss Kiss and Pearl, it's high time you made her acquaintance. Are you sure you wouldn't rather be kept an eye on yours? I imagine they must be quite as valuable. Yes, but how many pearls are handsome? It's a good thing James was never married, or his wife would be wearing them. Hmm. But I fancy they're in no danger. I'm not in the habit of having them stolen, which is more than can be said of actresses nowadays, judging by what I read in the papers. But come, I'm being very remiss as a hostess. Not that my guests need to feel any need of me. Oh, how are you, Lady Coverdale? See what I mean, Mr. Holmes? Yes. The lady and this girl certainly have a dagger up. You agree. Yes, and one in each garter as well. But come along and meet Kitty. Really? Yes, she's charming. Oh, I understand she gave you in nothing but milk. Absolutely milk. Oh, there you are, my dear Kitty. Looking younger every day. Oh, 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 that's because I'm happy. You must try it sometime. <laughs> I want you to meet two friends that Lord Damery has invited. They're here to see that nobody steals your pearls. I'd die if anything should happen to them while you were at a party of mine. Oh, they've never been threatened before, Lady Elizabeth. Are your parties more dangerous than the others I go to? Oh, oh now, Kitty, easy, does it? Uh, may I introduce my friends, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? Oh, no, this is wonderful. I've read all of Dr. Watson's famous account of your wonderful adventure. Oh, thank you so much. Your sensationalism, my dear Miss Kissam. Oh, I don't believe it for a moment. Such wonderful, dramatic material. Have you ever thought of writing them into a play, Dr. Watson? Well, Watson? that's already been done most successfully with a great American actor, Mr. William Gillette, who plays the leading role himself and does a far more creditable job of it, no doubt, than I could myself. Oh, I never believe that either. Hmm, yes. Have you ever thought of playing the board, Mr. Holmes? It's a certain, shall we say, voted about you. You would make a very exciting performance. No, no, no. Don't you try and persuade him to change his myth here, Miss Kitty. I'll never be able to follow him onto the stage. Well, <laughs> my dear, this would never do. Hello, Pat. <laughs> we can't allow these two people to monopolize you, Kitty, my sweet. You must meet some of our other friends. All in good time, Percy. First, give your fiancé a chance to catch a breath. Kitty, my dear, you must have a glass of champagne to brace you for the ordeal of meeting all these people. Percy, tell Paddleford to bring that tray over here. Oh, uh, very well, dear. I'm sure Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson could do with a spot. There's a bar in the ante room here if you'll just set in for a moment. Oh, James, my dear, aren't you forgetting what these gentlemen are here for? We can't leave Kitty unprotected. Ah, here's Paddleford. Allow me, Kitty, my dear. Oh, thank you, lady. Elizabeth. And a glass for you, Mr. Holmes, and one for... Oh, 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 oh how clumsy of me. Get a towel, run, Percy. James, change your handkerchief. Oh, I soaked Miss Kitty's beautiful sleeve. Oh, dear. Uh, look after the glasses. Get them swept up, Paddle, for quick. Well, that's not easy, Elizabeth. Easy. You're not hurt, are you, Kitty? They went right past your shoulder. Oh, no, I'm quite all right. Oh, but your sleeve, your beautiful sleeve, it's so... Oh, it doesn't matter, really. Here's a towel, my dear. Oh, just let me pack it. Dry. Good heavens. What is it? Your pearls. They're missing. Someone has stolen Miss Kitty's pearls. Oh, now, now control yourself, Alicia. They must have come loose in the excitement. No, they were stolen. I knew they would be. Yes, yes. I'm, I rather suspected the same thing myself, Lady Alicia. Of course, of course. They must be found. We must search everybody. Oh, no, please. Oh, this is awful. It's so embarrassing to everyone. Alicia, have you gone out of your mind? Uh, your sister's quite right, Lord Amory. We must search everybody. It's the only way to recover the pearls, and you and your nephew and the lady, Alicia, will be dispersed to the search. But, but that's preposterous. Yes, I know it is, but you can hardly expect your guests to submit to the indignity of a search if you don't um, set them an example. So shall we adjourn to the um, ante room, Lady Alicia? <laughs> Here we are, Mr. Holmes, my sister, my nephew, and myself. Which would you like to search first? Uh, suppose we allow Miss Kitty to choose. After all, it's a she who lost the pearls. Oh, really, Mr. Holmes? I... Oh, that is, I feel it's all so unnecessary. The pearls came loose in the excitement over the upset tray. They, they, they probably rolled under a chair or rug somewhere. If we wait until the guests have gone on show, we'll find them. Certainly not, my dear. Those pearls were stolen. There wasn't a chair or rug anywhere near us. Nothing but bare parquet floor and a lot of people. Yes, she's right about that, huh? Of course I'm right. There's a thief in my house, and I insist that the fact that he or she is probably a guest of mine should be no protection. After all, that necklace was given you by a certain royal personage. 
practically a historical relic. Yes, I know, but really I'd much rather not have any such a commotion. Nonsense, my dear. We must find the culprit. Everyone must be searched. Bravo, Lady Alicia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. And now that enough time has elapsed so that they will think that we've been thoroughly searched, suppose we call in the rest of the guests one at a time. You gentlemen can search the men, and uh, Kitty and I will search the ladies. Uh, behind that screen. Oh, please, I'd be much happy if you wouldn't. Nonsense. Let's get on with it. Right. But I still insist uh, the search begin with the camera. Oh, very well, if you insist on being a stickler for form. I suppose Percy and Lord Damery may as well turn out their pockets. Uh, no, Lady Elizabeth. We shall begin with you. Me? But I haven't any pockets. I don't even carry a reticule. So where could I hide anything? In your body. Now, Miss Kitten, if you will investigate Lady Alicia's body. The idea. The very idea. Oh, I'd... I'd much rather not. Very well. If you won't, Kitty, I will. James, don't you dare. James, get your hands off my neck. That's an outrage. James, stop. Stop it. I'm sorry, but I can't let this pass go on. I... That is... It's not worth it. That is, I... Well, you see... Those pairs aren't real. My dear. You mean the king gave you imitation jewelry? That whole story was made up by my publicity agent. He, well, he thought it would be good for me. I rather suspect you knew the pairs were imitation the first time you saw them. That's why you planned to show me up. But all, all these stories about you and the king... Oh, I'm so sorry to disappoint you, Percy, but I'm really quite a respectable person. I've never met a king. Well, I... I must say, this is a blow. Uh, a surprise, I mean. Uh, oh, I shall be terribly ragged by my pals, you know. They were all rather envious of me. Well, after all, no one needs no. We don't have to publicize this thing to the world. Oh, but I must tell my guests, James, dear. After all, I owe them some explanation if I let the whole matter drop after making such an issue of things. I'm sure that everyone will be interested to know that not only are Miss Kissam's pearls not real, but Miss Kissam is somewhat of an imposter herself. But how could you know that pearls were false, Mother dear? After all, ladies don't wear imitation jewels. And actresses don't wear trinkets given them by men who don't consider them ladies. Here is your engagement, then, uh, Let me... Well, I didn't really... Oh, this is... Keep the ring as a remembrance, don't you know? Thank you, Percy, but I'd rather not. Well, Alessia, now that you've accomplished the result for which the party was undoubtedly given, suppose you let me send the guests home. Oh, not before I've had a chance to explain. You'll do nothing of the kind. If Kitty Kissam wants people to think a king gave us some souls, that's her business. Thank you, Lord Damien, but it really doesn't matter. I'd, well, I'd just as soon they did not. That story of the royal pearls was beginning to make me feel just a bit foolish. Oh, I'll admit it was helpful when I was just a struggling small part player, but... Now, well, I flatter myself that my hold on the ladder of success is firm enough so that it'll take more than a few imitation pearls to shake me loose. Bravo, Miss Kitty. I salute your courage. Thank you, Miss Kitty. I see. Look here. Perhaps I've been a bit... Tasty, don't you know? You beat your silly mouth shut. I'll handle this from now on. You stay here, Alicia. I'm going to explain the situation to our guests. But, James... Alicia, shut up! Well, really... I'm afraid, Mr. Holmes, there's a speak of vulgarity in my brother. I'm sure I don't know where he comes from. Well, probably from the same place he gets his honesty and sense of fair play. Dear me, don't tell me you're going to be cross with me, too. By the way, whatever made you think that I might have secreted Miss Kitten's pearls in my body? My dear Lady Alicia, when something of value disappears during a manufactured commotion, the first one suspected should be the person who did the manufacturing. You mean, uh, you thought that I had set the tray on purpose? Uh, quite. Uh, but come, let us um, join the others, shall we? I think she's given Lord Damery ample time to make his explanation. Let's get him, if you will do me the honor. Watson, uh, you may escort the Lady Alicia. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, by the oh, look, here's one. Oh, well, that makes nine to nine. Uh, here's two more. A hundred and a hundred and one. I found five more, all in a little bunch. Oh, this is simply thrilling. So much more fun than hunting for Easter eggs. Well, that makes a hundred and six. James, what on earth are you doing? Hunting for pearls. Seems I was right in the first place. Miss Kissam's pearls weren't stolen. The string must have broken and threw them all over the place. Any more? We've looked everywhere. I'm sure there isn't an inch we haven't searched. Then here you are, my dear Kitty. Allow me to return your pearls. Oh, thank you. But I don't understand. Uh, tell me, uh, Miss Kissam. Yes? 
How many pearls were there on your string? A hundred and five. But Holmes, the Lord Dame, has just counted them. He mentioned a hundred and six. There's one more pearl now than there was when it was stolen. It's incredible. It's absolutely impossible. Oh, my dear Watson. No, 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 no. It's not incredible. It's not even impossible. It's uh, really enlightening. Uh, what do you deduce from the presence of this added proof of the humble oyster, Lady Alicia? Perhaps you can explain uh, why there are now 106 pearls in this different necklace. Did you say 106? But my necklace, the, the Davery pearls have 106. Good heavens, my necklace, it's gone. Someone has taken my pearls. Then uh, may I ask, uh, Lady Alicia, what pearls are those still hidden in your body? Oh, but those are Miss Kiffin's imitation. James must have taken mine off my neck when he was threatening to search me. And now he's pulled this trick to get even with me. The string that broke are my pearls. She has no right to them. They are the same any pearls. My dear Lady Alicia, there is one person who has a better right to them than yourself. That person, of course, would be Lord Damery's wife. Yes. Judging by the look in Lord Damery's eyes, Watson, wouldn't you say they, uh, they've been handed over to the proper party? My dear, yes. Elementary, my dear Holmes. Elementary. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, well, that was a uh, that was an interesting episode. I, I like the the, tw- the twist towards the end. Holmes didn't get to do a whole lot of the of uh, Holmes of Holmes lock work. A little bit, but the deduction uh, wasn't as complicated. But they did an interesting job of building up this plot and the secondary characters. Uh, so, another good episode. We can put that in the books. Um, and uh, this one, of course, was one of those uh, very rare World War II uh, pre-1945 episodes of Holmes that's out there. So, I was glad we were able to share that with you. Um, and uh, we do have, before we go, one comment on Facebook correcting something that I got a little bit off uh, on last week's uh, or a couple weeks ago show. A uh, comment uh, from Jim Adam. Edith uh, Miser wasn't the only writer of the Rathbone Bruce Sherlock Holmes episodes. All the episodes that I've heard that originally aired during the Petri Wine era were written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher. Well, that's definitely a, a fair point. I think that uh, there was a changeover, and I, I after I recorded the show, I... I checked the episode log. In the 45-46 uh, season, the entire thing was by Green and by Boucher. Um, so there was pr- probably a switchover. I don't know if it was at the beginning of the pre- Petri Wine era, uh, which started with the uh, 43-44 season, or if it was towards the uh, middle um, in the 44-45 season, but they did change um, they did change the writer, so good catch. This is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you yours truly, Johnny Dollar. you got any comments for me, send them to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Please cast your vote for the show over on uh, Podcast Alley at podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. Uh, and remember, we've got a new Facebook uh, page with uh, more than 20 uh uh, 20 fans, so please uh, jo- join that at facebook.greatdetectives.net. Uh, I've got a comment from Jeff. The sound quality, uh, this, uh, this came in regards to Murder Ain't Minor. He said, the sound quality, the last couple episodes has been pretty rough. I have a hard time understanding what is being said. I even thought the quality on your intro and exit was not as good as usual, kind of like you had a cold. Um, the reason on the intro and exit that is that I did kind of have a cold. Uh, uh, we're over that now, but he, he goes on to write, is there any affordable software you could use to enhance the quality? Um, when we're dealing with the quality of the episodes, I'm really not aware of anything that would make a, a significant difference uh, when we're dealing with a source that, that has flaws in it. Uh, much of this has not been... Uh, uh, well, as well preserved, and particularly during the Charles Russell years of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Uh, I don't think there there's, was the same preservation and care uh, that you'll find with some of the later episodes, or with uh, the commercial sets that are out there. 
Um, one thing I've been impressed with, with the radio archive, uh, Let George Do It recordings I've been listening to, is just the uh, phenomenal audio quality. And the, the reason they do that is they've actually worked this from the original transcription desk. Um, and you can do, you can do some, you can do some things if you're a really great audio expert and you're starting from the transcription desk. Um, when what you've got is the MP3 that some, somebody made from an older, uh, recording they transferred from a transcription desk, there's really, um, there's really a limit to what can be done to enhance the quality. Um, and unfortunately, this episode, there's there's a little bit of noise, and it's not as high quality as uh, we'd like, but I, but I hope people are enjoyed or are able to uh, listen to it. I know that over on the Old Time Radio Western side, Andrew Rhines did a survey, and people preferred that if, if, we, if all we've got is a low-quality audio, then we go ahead and we play that. Uh, by the way, we're going to go ahead with the movies, and I've, I've decided what I'm going to do here. Um, the app is not yet out as of this recording on January. I'm recording on January 22nd. It may be out by the time it's heard on January 29th. Um, but what I've decided to do with this uh, is I'm going to go ahead and we'll, we'll put the uh, video... Uh, in this case, it's going to be a movie out for people to watch and to uh, enjoy. And the commentary will be an extra that you'll need the app to listen to. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and if everything goes okay with the video test, um, which, uh, which by the time you hear this, you'll know whether it's gone okay or not. Uh, so we'll go ahead and we'll do one um, either movie or TV show a month, uh, focusing in general detective mystery genre. We may uh, expand a little bit just because we're dealing with a limited selection of, uh, of movies and uh, television shows that are available. We may expand a little bit, but we're still going to be something that's in the mystery detective, uh, occasionally maybe a, com- a detective comedy uh, but it's going to be in that same general genre. So uh, if everything goes okay with the uh, video test that uh, was run on January 23rd, uh, then we'll go ahead and uh, on February 6th you should have a um, uh, you should have an actual uh, video bonus. Um, all right. Well, we're going to get into today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. And we once again have a missing episode. How I turned a luxury liner into a battle uh, to a battle to battleship um, was uh, August 28, 1949. That one's missing. So now we're to September 4th of 49. Um, the good news is that from here on out, from this episode. Um, we don't have any uh, missing episodes until after the How I Played Santa Claus and almost got left holding the bag, uh, which we've already played. So we have the next, uh, this and 12 more straight uh, weeks where we'll be able to play through the Charles Russell episodes. Um, before we uh, get started, I do want to encourage you as you make your travel plans, um, please remember this name, johnnydollarair.com. If you don't have an action-packed expense account, johnnydollarair.com can help save you money on airline tickets, uh, hotels, rental cars, uh, and cruises uh, because johnnydollarair.com is priceline.com. And when you go to johnnydollarair.com, you can can get great deals and you can support the great detectives of old-time radio. Well, we're going to get into today's episode. Uh, this one is called uh, The Expiring uh, Nichols and the Egyptian Jackpot. I always say if you take a trip halfway around the world, you've got to expect you'll get your ticket punch. <laughs> This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. 
At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. News, the Constant Sun Trading Company, Cairo, Egypt. And uh, may I say, this is an unexpected place. The one thing I didn't expect to bump into during this case was somebody to pay the bill. It started out being my answer to a fire alarm rung 12,000 miles away by an old wartime friend. It wound up being a game of who gets killed first with a bunch of guys who suddenly declared themselves a small peacetime war. The difference of opinion arose over a little hassle I might call the expiring nickels and the Egyptian jackpot. <laughs> Expense account, item one, $2,200. Air transportation from little old Connecticut to big old French Indochina. Or specifically, Hartford to Haifany. That's why I got off the plane to take a breather. But after smelling the air and getting hit in the face with a bucket full of lukewarm raindrops, I got right on another plane bound for my destination, where I'd been summoned by an urgent cable, Calcutta. <laughs> took off on instruments in the downpour of a drenching monsoon. It was like climbing up a waterfall, blindfolded. We got chased up to 20,000 feet, clear up into the penthouse by a batch of black-hearted thunderheads laced with lightning. And there we stayed, sucking oxygen for nine dreary hours and waiting for the moment we'd get off our island in the sky. Item two, three rupees. Transportation from airport to the address of old friend who had summoned me. A place you'd never expect to find trouble. In church. And what a church. Two concert huts on Chowrangi Road. A couple of dozen wooden benches, a retired USO Hammond organ, and most important, this pastor. A guy I'd met when I was calling the CBI theater, my home away from home. Chaplain Joe Blessing. Johnny, it's good to see you. Long time, Joe. Too long. Uh, haven't changed a bit since you were passing out those SL slips to unhappy GIs. <laughs> so you did decide to stay out here after all. Yeah. Yeah, I decided the East Indian brand of food needed a little more saving than the kind I used to know back in Magnolia, Tennessee. <laughs> but come on in the office, Johnny. It was good of you to come right over. You must be wondering why you did. Well, your cable did start a worry or two, Joe. You know, when an ex-soldier gets the trouble call from a chaplain, something's really wrong. What's up? Sit down, sit down. Johnny, tell me. How'd you like to do some work in my department? Wait a minute. I wouldn't know where to start. I'm asking you to save a man's soul. And to save another man's life while you're doing it. Well, why me, Joe? Why did I ask you to come all the way from Hartford, Connecticut? Well, Johnny, the ways are devious. There wasn't time for me to do anything else. Huh? If I'd gone through the proper channels here, if I'd become involved with all the inevitable red tape, I... Well, there just wasn't time. Johnny, there's a man in Cairo waiting to be executed at dawn day after tomorrow for a murder he didn't commit. And here in Calcutta... And here in Calcutta is a man who not only witnessed that crime, but has in his possession the evidence that can save that man from swinging. Uh-huh. Well, who is this man on the flying rope end? Lionel Brook Nichols. He's the president of a vast enterprise called the Constant Sun Trading Company. Now, Johnny, I wasn't ignoring the fact that you work for a living. I'm sure that if you're successful, you can name your own price. This is not a colloquialism, Johnny. But Mr. Brook Nichols has nothing but money. I didn't realize that such big men got into such big trouble. Oh, he didn't get into it all by himself. Huh? Oh, no. Now, this particular big man had the bad luck to have a fun-loving cousin who'd like to see him out of the way and the faster the better. Name of? Miles Atkinson. Uh, he must be some sort of big wheel in the Egyptian government. That's all I know about him. Except that the gain control of the Constant Sun Company, he would move heaven and earth to see Brook Nichols dead. Well, I don't care what he does with the earth, but uh, I guess I can't stand by and let him mess around with your heaven. Now, let's get on a case. What about this dude here in Calcutta, the witness for the evidence? Well, his name's William Briggs. He's a 
very sick man, sir. Mm -hmm. Knowing that he might die soon, and it looks like he might. He's had a sudden rush of conscience for the mouth he wants to talk. Evidently, he's decided that since it's too late to save his body, he'd better do a quick job on his soul. And I nurse him to Cairo, is that it? No. Oh. I'm sending a young assistant of mine who will take that job off your hands. I think you'll like him, son. Now, I want you to get Briggs for the right assistant. Arrangements have been made for an ambulance to meet you in Cairo. And, well, we've chartered a cargo plane to take you there. Now, the pilot says he can get you there by tomorrow night. Well, I've spent so much time in the air getting here that it shouldn't make any difference. But, uh... Why a cargo plane? Why not a passenger plane? They have nice soft feet. So, Johnny, the airlines refuse to transport a leper. Evans sure has some good salesmen on the road, and Chaplain Joe Blessing is one of the best. Before I knew it, a big Horizons Unlimited plane was lifting off the runway at Calcutta, and I was in it. Sitting on a suitcase, it looked like I'd never have time to unpack. The invalid Briggs was forward, being bedded down under the gentle hand of Chaplain Joe's assistant, Frankie. Well, that is done. And I give up each Saturday afternoon at Belmont Park for this. You're in luck, Frankie. Think of all the losers you miss betting on. Mr. Dollar, you have the philosophy of a man who has never enjoyed the exquisite thrill of losing his last two dollars upon a horse who was retarding the improvement of the breed. Young man, you've never heard of the Bluegrass Branch of the Dollar family? Kentucky, sir. Mr. Dollar, sir, uh, mm. if it were not for a second horse from Kentucky named Breezy Boy who ran a very poor ace at Rockingham, I would not only be a Kentucky colonel, I would be a Kentucky general, passing the time of day with my esteemed co-general... Three-star Hennessy. Uh, yes. That's it. Here's briefcase. Briggs. He wants you should take care of it. Now, what's that? What's in it should be in a holster. How do you know? Mr. Dollar, I got to take the field. Besides, I look. It's a Luger. A Luger, huh? Yeah. Off that, I'd say we are now in possession of the evidence. The murder weapon. In person. Exhibit A. Oops. Still loaded. <laughs> Exhibit A, making an arsenal out of my right coat pocket, we touched wheels at Bombay for three hours and fuel, and then hiked back up for the run across the Arabian Sea. We made landfall high on the coast of Saudi Arabia. And the freight of the Cuff shoreline led us on to the Queen of Sheba's old hometown, Aden, while we sat down again for service, airplane and personal. Frankie and I got our sick man Briggs out and into the shade of a hangar, figuring he could use a breath of fresh air. But he didn't find it in that sun-baked hellhole. A grubby little ground crew burned up four valuable hours, taking their own unsweet time servicing the ship. That left us just eight hours to get Briggs and his evidence up to Cairo left me almost enough time to save Mr. Brooke Nichols from taking the rope ride. Estimated time of arrival, midnight. Time of execution, 6 a.m. And I've learned that British officials are hard to wake up. The pilot stood the ship straight on its tail and made a fighter takeoff getting out of there. We were 40 minutes out of Aden, about 5,000 feet above the Red Sea, when we ran into what I've learned to expect in my business, the unexpected. Hello. Could uh, either of you gentlemen tell me where I pay my fare? Well, for... Cr where did you come from? Hey, a walk-on like this I have not seen since Minty. It's all right, gentlemen. You can pop your eyes back in. You've seen a woman before. Well, I've never scooped one up out of the sky before. Could it be she's an angel? What are you doing here? I... I'm afraid I'm what you'd call a stowaway. How'd you get aboard? When the plane was empty, I locked myself in the popper room. I'm sorry I had to do it this way, but I have to get to Cairo immediately. The next airline flight doesn't go out till 11 tonight. I should write to the captain and have him turn around and dump you back. Please, don't. I'm perfectly willing to pay my way. Don't worry. We can't spare the time. Mr. Dollar, there are only certain things which make air travel a pleasure to certain people. With me, that is a stewardess, and I would be glad to brief her about her duties. Uh, you go check the patient, Frankie. 
I'll check, Miss Stowaway. Uh, that's what comes from always being only an assistant. I noticed that poor man on the stretcher when you took him out. Who is he? Never mind. What's your name? Fate Fabian. Uh, what's so important you've got to get to Cairo this way? Sorry, Mr. Dollar, that's a secret. It's also a secret how you get into that tight little dress you're wearing. I'm glad you like it. A dress, yes. Secrets, no. When I find myself in an airplane with a stowaway, I smell trouble. That trouble you smell costs $85 an ounce. Now, listen, save your sharp talk for a cocktail ounce. Don't waste it here. You must think I'm kidding. This is serious. You're flying across international boundaries. Now, who are you? I told you. Fate Fabian. Here. Here is my passport, and here is money. How much? Okay. We'll call it a sort of bond to ensure your good behavior. Five hundred dollars. All that was good behavior? That's awful high. So is this airplane. If you don't like it, jump. <laughs> didn't jump, and uh, after seven and a half more droning hours, I was glad of it. Faith Fabian was all woman, all beautiful, all in a pretty nice relief from watching the time run through my wristwatch. She spent most of the trip sharing my suitcase with me, but once I looked up at her, she was silhouetted against the window, posed against that moonstruck Egyptian sky, and it was almost worth the trip, the way she looked wearing those stars in her hair. Just about then, a vague glow on the horizon took over where my conscience left off. We were coming into Cairo, and the problem of landing 50,000 pounds of airplane replaced the problem of landing 120 pounds of woman. I've never learned how to hold back a sigh of relief when I hear those big tires take a hole in the runway. I tried another one when I saw an ambulance standing by at the parking ramp. By the time the loading platform was pushed into place and the door opened, the ambulance was backed up, ready to receive brakes. Oh, are you the set bringing in Mr. Briggs in from Calcutta? Yeah, that's right. Never mind a stretcher. He's on one. Oh, right, sir. We'll thank you more, then. Come along, Roscoe. Come in. You all ready to go, Frankie? Mr. Dollar, what's your language? That is not the thing to say about Mr. Briggs. Bunch people look at home in that ambulance. Ah, then. Oh, congratulations upon the trip, Governor. Thanks. Ah, uh, take the other end, Ross. Go. Oh, well, hoist the poor chap out of here. Oh, here we go now. Hey, I'd better check with the pilot, Frankie. Give these guys a hand, will you? They may need it getting down that ramp. Anything that moves me toward the end of this is a pleasure. Now, you want me to help this thing in? Hey. Hey, Mr. Dollar, these guys ain't just plain ambulance driver. <laughs> Just a moment, we return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, whatever you're planning to do over the Labor Day weekend, be sure to plan to listen over most of these same stations tonight to a wonderful new show on CBS. It's Horace Heights' original Youth Opportunity Show, a full half hour of fun and excitement. You'll get the thrill of a lifetime hearing talented young Americans get the chance of a lifetime. Don't forget, Sunday night with Horace Heights. The Horace Height Original Youth Opportunity Show, starting tonight on CBS. Tune in, tune in, Miss Ball, for the show that you love best of all. Listen carefully, hear the address. It's CBS, CBS. Now with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I had made four steps toward the cockpit when I heard Frankie yell, and a half a step back toward the door when I heard the shot. By the time I got to the top of the ramp, the ambulance was about 20 yards away, and pitted against that distance were two overlapping thoughts. One, the way to stop, or at least slow it down, was to puncture the rear tires. Two, the two at hand was that loaded Exhibit A Luger that should have been in my pocket. It wasn't there. I looked around, didn't see it. But I thought I knew where to find it. 
Come on. Come on, open up. Or I'll put this fire extinguisher through that door. And if your head isn't in the way, I'll get that Wait next. Wait a minute. Moral, don't use the same hiding place twice. It could be that I wasn't hiding. And it could be that that purse is now holding a looter. <laughs> Give me it. Yeah. Now all I need is to hear you say you don't know how it got there. I don't know how it got there. That does it. Come on, you're coming with me. Come on, get going. Ouch! You don't have to do that. What I did have to do was dig up some transportation. It turned out to be a taxi whose driver had slept with the excitement and therefore was the only one at the hack stand. I think he was still asleep when I gave my unwilling companion an ungentlemanly shove into the rear seat. And we left. Nobody in full control of their faculties could drive the way he did. He knew he had a horn, but somebody had forgotten to tell him about brakes. All I had to go on was the direction in which that ambulance had taken off. Straight toward Cairo. So, that's where we went. Straight toward Cairo. Come on, whatever your name is, sit up, Dr. Story. My name is Faith Fabian. Well, I couldn't be less interested. What I want to know is where are those friends of yours take Briggs and Frank? I have no friends. I can believe that. <laughs> Whatever those thugs are, where are they? I don't know what you're talking about. Now, don't be coy. You and those mugs in that ambulance, add up, that's all. Doesn't take any brains to figure out what you're all working for the same guy. What same guy? Miles Atkinson. A guy that's trying to keep witness Briggs and his evidence from saving Brooke Nichols from hanging. About five and a half hours. From You're now. being stupid. Maybe so. All I know is somebody got away with a witness. And I find the evidence sharing your purse with your eyebrows. I found platform. it on the plane. Somebody must have dropped oh, it. Oh, don't give me that. You can probably recite the serial number. Okay. You want the murder weapon? I'm going to be a real nice guy. Just long enough to give it to you. And then I'm going to give you to the police. They have a nice little game they play with combinations like that. <laughs> I am. Now, this girl keeps telling me her name is Faith Fabian. How do you do, Inspector? I've looked forward to this. I'll bet. Well, my name is Johnny Dollar. I'm looking for somebody who knows the Brooke Nichols case. Well, you certainly came to the right place. I know about the Brooke Nichols case. Well, that's what I'm here about. You can bust that case wide open, Inspector. Brooke Nichols is innocent. Now, here. This Luger is all the evidence we'll need. Thank you, Mr. Dollar. Uh, one thing you'll still have to help me find, though, is a man named Briggs. Uh, he was an eyewitness to the murder. I brought him all the way from Calcutta, and somebody put the snatch on him at the airport. Not only that, they grabbed the guy who was helping me. Oh, yes. Yes, that would be the obstreperous young gentleman you call Frankie. Oh, you know where he is? Oh, yes, indeed I do. Things are all right? Yes. If you could call a man all right when he's just been arrested for the murder of Mr. Briggs. Murder? Yes. Mr. Briggs was stopped in the ambulance that took him from your plane. Hey, what is this? This is a very good time for both of you to remain perfectly still, Mr. Dollard, after you raise your hand. Yes, Miss Fabian, you needn't bother. There's hardly enough of that dress to conceal all of you, let alone a weapon. Thank you. Mr. Dollard, this is what a romanticist would call a poetic injustice. You see, this Luger, the evidence, as you call it, happens to belong to me. But that's the murder weapon. Who are you, anyway? Chief of Inspectors, Miles Atkinson. Miles Atkinson? Oh, no. Oh, yes. I fly 5,000 miles from Calcutta to put you in the hands of the police. And you turn out to be the police. Yes. Uh, bloody convenient, isn't it? Not for me. It isn't. Sit steady, old boy. You know, this gun was probably the most fortunate purchase I ever made in my life. First, it killed a man who was in my way. Then, because it disappeared, it made it possible for me to establish false evidence, ostensibly proving that my esteemed cousin, Brooke Nichols, was guilty of the murder. And now, his death by hanging will place in my hands the controlling interest of the Constant Sun Trading Company. Quite a bargain. 
Thank you, Mr. Bauer. Not you, the gun. Which I shall now put to its final use. And after it is disposed of you two, I shall dispose of it. That was the prettiest confession I've ever heard. I'm surprised that a chief inspector and bargain hunter can sell himself out so cheaply. What do you mean by that? That the confession was complete, voluntarily made in front of witnesses, and that we are leaving with it, and that you are coming with us. Hey, fight, baby, take it easy. No sense going on a make for a hot bullet. Mr. Dollar is right. I warn you, the one who moves first dies first. Very well. Wait, one step closer, Miss Fabian. I'm not afraid of you. All right, you asked for it. Now take it. What is this? No use, what no bullet. No, you can't stop me. No, you won't. The lady stays so far, now it's boys. Look out, he's going to die. Oh, Mr. Did throw the gun, but not at me. At the single light fixture in the middle of the ceiling. And when that went out, so did Atkinson. Out through the door. And the case was on. There was no dope. He knew where the light switches were. He, as he went racing past them, he switched them off. It was like night flying without the benefit of a carrot in my diet. Chasing him down those long, empty, edgy corridors and up the stairs to the roof. At the door of the roof, I threw on our brakes by throwing it on our face. He was soft. It was dark, but I was scared. I figured Atkinson might have picked up a weapon on the way. And that turned out to be an underestimate. What he had picked up was a fire hose. When we stepped through the door, we got hit by a big fat boat of liquid lightning. A couple of hundred pounds of water backed up by a couple of thousand pounds of pressure. It felt like a salmon swimming upstream to spawn. Over at the edge of the roof, braced against the low parapet, was Atkinson, using all his weight to keep the writhing nozzle from flipping him around. He was just one man on a fire department there. I'm over on the other side, trying to throw that water off him. <laughs> Get over that valve. See it? That wheel over there. The end of the hose he ate on. Put off the water. Come on. I see it. I got it. Dropping away to a dribble, the hose suddenly snapped its muscle up to a target as the driving surge of water went through it. <laughs> and before Atkinson could get himself untangled from the canvas and rubber snake, it snapped him over the parapet, off the roof, and high into the night. Hey, Speech! Turn off that water! Inspector Atkinson off the roof. And he made a hole in one. Right through that gallows down there. The same gallows from which Brooke Nichols was supposed to hang in a few hours. Oh, that's horrible. Let's, let's move away from here. Hey, wait a minute. That's not like you. After all, you're the gal who turned that water up and set it down. You wanted it done right. Why didn't you send a plumber? I won't ask you whether you meant it that way or not. As far as I'm concerned, it turned out, turn out just jolly this way. Oh, and, uh... While I'm at it, I'd like to thank you for taking such a brave chance with my life downstairs in the office. Oh, really, Mr. Dollar? I knew that gun wasn't loaded. I unloaded it myself back in the powder room in the airplane, just before you accused me of trying to steal it, remember? The next time I take a shower, I promise to wash my mouth out with soap. But now I figure it's also about time you came clean. Really, now, who are you? I'm sorry, my name is Phil Faith Fabian. All right, you've made a sale. Your name is Faith Fabian. Well, what's your interest in this case? No interest at all. It's just part of my job. They do hire people to police the police, you know. I happen to be one of those people. Do you want to see my credentials? Your credentials look all right to me, baby. <laughs> got off the subject, off the roof, and into the problem of getting Brooke Nichols off the end of a rope. After going through those motions, and that gal made all the motions, including retrieving young Frankie from the pokey, I kissed Faith Baby and goodbye, just for luck. And receiving no interest on that investment, we headed back to the airfield. By the 
sign that fireball Egyptian sun and poke its top rim over the leftover GI issue hangers at the east end of the field. The plane was serviced and panning to pry open the sky. Came the time to board ship, came a visitor. I feel boy. Mr. Duller about. Yeah, about right here. Oh, splendid, splendid. I'm Lionel Brooke Nichol. Congratulations. I suppose you know you saved my life. You know, with a lot of help, yeah. Well, I should like to make it up to you somehow. Is there anything I can do? Well, uh, besides paying my expenses. Oh, naturally, naturally. Send your check to the Constant Sun Trading Company. You'll be paid post haste. But beyond that. Well, uh, it could do something for the guy who got me out here. Back in Calcutta, I have an old army buddy named a Chaplain Joe Blessing. He runs a church. Oh, splendid, splendid. Perhaps I could donate a stained glass window or uh, anything you suggest. Did you say anything? Yes, anything. Okay. Well, look, Chaplain Joe Blessing doesn't need a stained glass window because he hasn't got any place to put it. What he does need is a new church, a real one with steeples and all that. Oh. Oh. All right, then. Very well. Done. <laughs> account, item three. Same as original entry, transportation from the land of the Sphinx to the land of the free, by way of Calcutta, where I delivered a happier, though wiser, Frankie, received the blessings of Chaplain Joe Blessing, and ordered a custom-made, lightweight, pearl-handled blackjack in blue suede, and inscribed to Fate Fabian, with a hope that you will never fail to supply the black to go with its blue, love, J.D., Ah, uh, well, I guess that's all. Oh, uh, expense account total. Oh, wait, uh, there's one more. Expense account item four. Ten dollars. Paid to Cassidy's Pawn Shop, Hartford, Connecticut, for a purchase of one Hawk Air Medal. After all that flying, I thought I deserved one. Now, uh, expense account total, $5,350.40. If you don't think a founder of your company is worth that, kindly suggest someone who might. Yours, um, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, was produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell with script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Georgia Ellis, Jack Edwards, Harley Bear, and Paul Dubov. The special music is written and conducted by Lee Stevens. Be sure to be with us again when Johnny Dollar returns to the air after a short vacation. Listen on Saturday, October 1st, when another most unusual expense account is handed in by yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Next week at this time on many of these same stations, Eve Arden will bring you the madcap adventures of America's favorite schoolmistress, our Miss Brooks. Miss Arden, who has been heard later on Sunday evening for more than a year, is moving to this new time, and CBS cordially invites you to hear her and her famous brand of comedy. To make sure, consult your local newspaper listings next Sunday for the new time when you'll hear Eve Arden and our Miss Brooks. Now, stay tuned for your hit parade on parade, which follows immediately over the same CBS network station. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, that was Johnny Dollar heading to Egypt. A nice little international uh, adventure with a couple, uh, a couple good twists thrown in there. Uh, and, uh, of course, we hear the mention of the war. And uh, <clears throat> it's not 
too surprising. The war gets mentioned, um, even if it's not something that's in the forefront, as in this case on Johnny Dollar, uh, uh, Johnny's service in the war is not in the, the forefront of something that's been uh, talked about a whole lot. Uh, but a, most, a great number of Americans um, had served in the war, um, had gone overseas, and so you've got a very large portion of veterans in the population. Uh, so it can it comes up, and it's remarkable, of course, when we think of how relatively few people uh, have military experience today. So it's it's one of those very unique things to the late uh, '40s, after World War II, when the Greatest Generation went over, and they uh, uh, and they uh, did. Uh, did their duty and fought for their country um, versus today when it, it it really you know if if they served in the military it's something that's almost uh, intentional it's about the plot it's about establishing the character it's something that we've got to know up front this one uh, because it's such was such a common experience uh, was just kind of uh, uh, was just kind of uh, something that could be dropped into the story and always uh, used for a plot. And yeah, he uh, the airline prices was was just amazing. That's uh, that's that's why we recommend Johnny Dollar Air. All right, well we got some uh, more comments. Uh, these from Podcast Alley, uh, excellent show. And uh, another comment: I love the format of the show and the selection of detectives. I've unsubscribed to other old time radio shows to keep listening to this one. Well, thanks, and we appreciate your support over on Podcast Alley. And you can cast your vote at podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. Um, and uh, if you've got any comments, feel free to email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, but from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.